There we go. That's a little bright. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our listening session here in uh, Modesto, California. I've asked uh, uh, Doug LaMalfa to lead us in a prayer. If, so would everybody rise? Good morning. Please bow with me. Dear Lord, we are so grateful and thankful as a people, as a nation, for the opportunity to gather here to the, on a day like this as a free people to express ourselves, to help mold and shape the direction of our government, which, as we know, is formed by you, is appointed by you. Help us this day to have constructive and positive conversations that are informative for our constituents as, and as well as for us as the leaders you appoint to take back to D.C. and make the best possible beneficial decisions in the process for our people. We give thanks for all of our people. We give thanks for our great nation. We also want to give thanks for those folks in law enforcement that protect us on the front lines, on our cities, in our counties, and those overseas that help keep the flag flying high in the United States around the world. We ask these things and we give praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I've asked uh, uh, Hunter Andrade from the uh, FFA to lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance. Hunter? Thank you, everybody. So we've got uh, several of our FFA folks here. We've got Luke O'Leary, who's the state president. Luke, stand up. There we go. We've also got Jasmine Flores, secretary. Uh, Genevieve Regelli, who is the treasurer. We have Armando uh, Navarez, who's the reporter. Hunter Andrade, who's the sentinel. And is Bobby Marshy here? Bobby. Bobby, I don't have a, a job description for you. What? You're just an interested bystander. Thank you for being here, buddy. <laughs> Future of agriculture. We're proud to have the FFA kids with us this morning. And uh, it's always great seeing them in D.C. with those, especially in May and early June when it's hot and humid and they've got those corduroy jackets on and you never see them take them off. So it's good stuff. I would also like to recognize uh, Karen Ross. Where's Ms. Ross? Karen Ross is here, Secretary of Ag for California. So I've asked each member to uh, introduce themselves. I'm going to start with our host uh, member, uh, Mr. Lamoff, I mean, uh, Mr. Denham. Denham. <laughs> well, good morning and welcome to Modesto. Uh, you know, we uh, talk a lot uh, on the Ag Committee about uh, the different challenges across the entire country, uh, the different things that we're facing here in, uh, in California, and certainly in California's Central Valley. There's no better way to... Uh, um, really understand our community and our industry than coming here. So I want to welcome the chairman as well as members uh, from the Ag Committee and my friend uh, David Valadeo from uh, Ag Appropriations. Uh, they all come together uh, to get a better understanding of the different issues that we have. And I just want to welcome you here. Real quickly, not only in the middle of California's Central Valley where we grow just about everything, um, but you're at MJC, and, and Modesto Junior College is uh, what I'd say is, is like no other. Uh, we have a main campus downtown, uh, but right here in the Ag Pavilion, we've got uh, all kinds of events we do here. We compete nationally um, against uh, many of the universities around the country on a lot of the different uh, ag programs. It's something that we, uh, we really are proud of here. So welcome to Modesto and the uh, 10th, uh, 10th District of California. Thanks, Jeff. Um, my name is Doug LaMalfa. I'm a co congressman from the first district of California. It was the very top end of the state. We uh, touched Oregon and Nevada in that corner there with an 11 county district. Uh, heavy on resources, ag, etc. I'm a member of the House Ag Committee as well as the House Natural Resources Committee and the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And basically, I just follow Jeff around to his committees and it works out very well. He's one of my best friends in Congress and uh, all through this. So in my real life, I'm a rice farmer, 
just uh, west of Oroville. You all may have heard of Oroville. Um, so I'm, I'm on the committees I'm on for the basic reasons, to help agriculture, to build more water supply and have wise use of our water supply, which includes us, and to have the infrastructure that gets our raw materials and finished products where they need to be through our highway system, et cetera. And so we're focused very, very deeply on making those issues work with this new administration. We're making some headway. And so I'm glad to be here in Modesto. We're always proud to see the FFA folks here. Some of them know my daughter. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure. Now, what I'd hoped last night, I brought my Mustang down here, and Modesto's supposed to be famous for the cruise night, according to American Graffiti, but I didn't find the cruise. So maybe you guys can point that out to me a little later. So real pleasure to be here. Thank you all. Good morning, David Valadeo. I sit on the House Ag Appropriations Committee. Well, the House Appropriations, one of my subcommittees is Ag. Um, I'm also on the Military Construction and the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development uh, subcommittees. Uh, I represent California's 21st Congressional District, which is just south of here, uh, basically from Fresno County all the way down to Kern County, so the, the grapevine. I obviously represent a lot of agriculture as well. Um, very proud of my agriculture background. I'm a dairy farmer in my real life. Um, so this is something that's very personal to me and something I'm thrilled to be a part of. And, and I thank the chairman and, and Jeff for inviting me to be a part of this and uh, really looking forward to hearing everybody's input. Thank you very much. My name is Dwight Evans. I'm, I'm, you could say I'm from the east of here. I'm from uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I'm in the second congressional district. I'm on the House Ag Committee. I'm on the Small Business Committee. And in my district, I have a school called Saul Agricultural School, which has the largest future farmer of America in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, I have been very active on the issue of ag. I've always stressed the part about consumers and farmers have a direct connection in this, and everybody likes food. So again, I appreciate this opportunity and chairman's leadership. Well, thanks, gentlemen. I'm glad you joined us this morning, and uh, we're here to, uh, to listen. We've got a couple of other uh, folks I'd like to introduce. We have Steve, De uh, Steve DeBron, who's the mayor of Manteca. Steve, are you here? There he is. Steve, thank you for joining us. We also have uh, Gary uh, Seisheth. Next one. Yeah. Gary Seisheth, who's the mayor of Turlock. Uh, Gary, where are you? Gary, thank you, Gary. Appreciate you being here along with uh, Karen Ross. Again, I want to thank the school for uh, hosting this this morning. They have been terrific. Uh, just just incredibly well, easy to work with. Got everything done that we asked for and beyond. The security guys have been off scale good and uh, anticipating everything we want. So I'd like to thank Dr. Excuse me, Don, uh, Don uh, Borges, who's the Dean of uh, Department of Ag, Agriculture and Environmental uh, Sciences. So Don, thank you very much for that. I also want to thank our moderator today here in a second, uh, Paul Winger, who's the uh, president of the California Farm Bureau and uh, also a recent witness in D.C. We uh, put him through that crucible uh, here recently as well. So, but I want to thank everyone who came this morning. I'm not sure how, who, who drove or, or came the furthest, but uh, we certainly appreciate it. We're going to listen. This will be a pretty odd experience for the five of us uh, to sit here and not say anything for the next couple of hours while we listen to you. Uh, if one of us has a question about something you say to us, we'll certainly you know, try to clarify it, but uh, we're just going to listen. It's your show. It's your event, and uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, and you got two minutes to squeeze it all in there. Uh, one thing that would be helpful, <clears throat> just know, all of us know, you thank us for being here. So don't waste any of your two minutes thanking us for being here. Just get right to the heart of what you want to say. Uh, you don't need the pleasantries and all that kind of good stuff because two minutes ago got pretty fast. We're going to try to hear from as many people as we can. Paul will walk through the details of that here in a second, but uh, we want to get to that uh, very quickly. All of this folds into the Farm Bill process that uh, uh, they were coming to, uh, to toward the end of. I hope to have the Farm Bill uh, with, with uh, the three gentlemen here that are with me on the Ag Committee to, uh, on the floor sometime late in the fourth quarter of 17, the first quarter of 18. Uh, we're driven to get this thing done on time for the first time in 16 years. Your testimony this morning, your comments, uh, as well as your written comments, those of you that don't have a chance to, to talk to us and get it into the transcribed record, uh, just know there's a website there. You can submit any written information you want to, and it will be considered just like the oral testimony will be this morning. So uh, if you've got something that's uh, longer than two minutes that you want to talk to us about, Vaughn, uh, be sure and, and submit that for the uh, written record as well. But 
Getting this farm bill done is important. The stability associated with getting it on time, avoiding the, the drama of the expirations and short-term extensions and permanent law threats, all of that drama, let's avoid that this time and, and get it done. And your uh, input this morning is going to be uh, really important. We've done one of these in Florida, Texas, uh, Minnesota, uh, day before yesterday, California today, and we'll have one in Illinois at the end of the month. So a broad spectrum of uh, ag production, none more varied, none more broad than the Central Valley of California. I don't know if there's anything you guys don't grow out here. Um, but maybe weeds, I'm not sure you grow any weeds, but uh, not the smoking weed, the other. That was a, that was a bad, bad phrase, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm from, I was thinking of stuff you don't want to grow in your fields. Anyway, better shut up. So we've asked Paul Winger to, uh, to be the moderator. Paul, you want to walk through the, uh, the mechanics of how we get people up and down? And so thank you very much for being here. There'll be some closing comments later, but from this point forward, we hope to just listen to you. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman Conaway. Um, and thank you for letting me be a moderator. It's nice, a uh, mile from home. So in my alma mater, although uh, this wasn't quite the way it was when I was going to Modesto Junior College, but I date myself. But having something like this uh, for this area is great. Great to be able to have the uh, uh, group here for the lessening session and having the chairman here uh, and the other members of the Ag Committee. As I told the chairman, we were talking yesterday, we've, I don't know that there's any other uh, town in the United States that's had two secretaries of agriculture come from their town, like we have here with Ann Veneman and Richard Ling, and we've had five state uh, Ag Secretary uh, come from this town. So uh, agriculture is really key, not only the Valley, but here in Stanislaus County and Modesto. So thank you for being here and bringing the group here. Chairman Conaway, we really appreciate it. So the rules of the road is, as long as my battery holds up, I'll have it on a timer for two minutes, and at about uh, a minute and a half, we're gonna pretend this is yellow. Uh, there's no kids in our household anymore, so I ran over to Walmart, and that's as yellow as I could find. I apologize. And then when we get to two minutes, I'm gonna hold up this other very flamboyant looking color, and that'll let you know to end your comments. Now I will say, just try to hit the high points. At the end, we will have up on the screen where you can send your written comments. It'll be House Ag Listens at mail.house.gov, but that'll be up there at the end. And so certainly the committee would like to have all of your written comments as well. So please keep your comments concise. In short, I'm gonna call two names. The first one, I'd like to come up to the east microphone, and then the other one will come over here. And so as we're transitioning, I'll call the next person, and we'll just kind of go back and forth. So I'm gonna call two names. The first one's gonna be Tony Toso, and so Tony, we'll have you head over to this one uh, on the east side. And then the second one is gonna be Bill Matos, and we'll come over here, and I think you might have to make sure that your microphones are on there. So again, you'll have two minutes, and uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can, and I think we're scheduled for about two hours. So we'll see uh, how many we can get through. So Tony, we're gonna to start with you. California Farm Bureau, second vice president. Yes, yes. there we go. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for, for uh, being here to take our, our comments today. Uh, just to put a little bit of brief context behind my comments, I'm gonna try to keep this general because you're gonna hear a lot of different stories this morning from different agricultural people that are, that are gonna be able to convey a, a pretty good message. So in a state that produces $47 billion worth of product and, and uh, let's see, <laughs> We've run from 47 to 56 billion. It's pretty imperative that California plays a major role in, in getting these comments out today. And, um, <laughs> excuse me, research and development, specialty crops, and being able to um, uh, tackle labor issues, immigration issues, and different options for crop insurance, those types of issues are going to be very important uh, and, and plays a major role in what we do here in California. We greatly appreciate your attention to, uh, to these specialty crop programs, being able to fund new research and development, almonds, and the different, uh, different commodities that we do produce here in California. Uh, equipment funding, or equip funding, is going to be very critical for us. Complying with regulation, air quality, uh, those types of programs too. Uh, continuation of livestock and disaster program. We've just gone through the Detweiler fire, um, the LIP program, 
the ELAP program are going to be really critical components to helping us stave off disaster programs that uh, help us to uh, uh, manage and mitigate these, these damages that have occurred. Uh, we lost recently lost 660 acres in those fires. Um, and the ability to help our communities and our agricultural community um, uh, fight through those uh, uh, problems is going to be very critical. We'll uh, we will be submitting some more extensive comments, uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Two minutes does go fast, I'll tell you. So next we're going to have Bill Mattis and then Vaughn Collegian uh, can step up over there and for anybody that didn't get caught coming in the door, if you want a speaker card, uh, look for the staff back there and fill out one of these speaker cards and we'll get you in the lineup. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew uh, for the speaker cards, they're back there in the back and you get one filled out and give it to staff. Thank you. Bill. Good morning, Chairman Conway, members of the Congress. I'm Bill Mattis, President of the California Poultry Federation. On, on behalf of our federation and all those who rely upon the industry and the state for their livelihood, we are here today to support animal disease prevention in the Farm Bill. After the devastating outbreak of high path AI that started here in California and swept across the country, we must do all we can to avoid it in the future. That is why we are supporting the mantra of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure by advocating for a new program that focuses on animal pest and disease prevention. We look forward to working with you, Chairman Conway, and Ranking Member Peterson to authorize and fund this forward-looking approach to the House bill. Since 2015 outbreak, the turkey industry has made significant strides and similar case of high path in Indiana this year indicates our improvements. But we still lost critical, critical export markets. As the committee embarks on the reauthorization of the farm bill, the California Poultry Federation joins the National Turkey Federation and over 70 associations that are asking for inclusion of a mandatory program in the Farm Bill. I'm not going to go into the key provisions because I've sent it into your, your website and I'm going to do that. There's one other issue that's very important to us and we think it's about done, but we want to, I want to point out GIPSA was a disastrous for the poultry industry. We understand that the Office of Management and Budget has temporarily suspended work on the Farmer Fair Practices Rule, the two proposed rules, and one interim final rule, also known as GIPSA rules. As California Poultry Federation, as well as National Chicken Council and National Turkey Federation stated in multiple sets of public comments filed by GIPSA rules earlier this year, these rules would have disastrous effects on our poultry industry, and our contract growers here in California oppose them. So we are pleased to see the department pause and review these costly, burdensome, burdensome regulations, and we hope they will be permanently rescinded once and for all before the October 22nd deadline. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. I got to tell you, usually it's me getting flagged with these little colors. I, I, it's great to be on the other side of it. Hey, stop, stop, that's it. So anyway, it's great. Uh, if we could have uh, Vaughn will be up next, and coming up, uh, Steve Summer. Stephen Summer. Vaughn. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning. My name is Vaughn Collegian. I'm a farmer of grapes for raisins and almonds in Fresno County. I've met with numerous of you in the past. Thank you. I also work for Sunmade Growers in Kingsburg, and I want to talk to you about a nutrition topic today. Sunmade Growers of California is a 105-year-old cooperative owned by 700 raisin farmer members, and we request that you support the amendment HR 3402 no, to the Richard B. Russell National yeah, Food they, they Lunch Act, which will specifically which will specifically allow canned, frozen, dried, and pureed foods and vegetables to be included in the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. Further, we believe that all other federal feeding programs, including the school breakfast and lunch programs, align with the United States Department of Agriculture's 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which appropriately recommends that Americans eat all forms of fruits and vegetables, including canned, dried, and frozen. For background, the USDA's program SNAP program is administered in eligible elementary schools in all 50 states. I've left a written copy, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Historically, have there have been legislative efforts to restrict the fruit and vegetable program to a fresh-only program. Such efforts have denied school food service nutritionists and service managers the opportunity to make their own decision as to the most appropriate snack to offer elementary school children. It's simply wrong that some members of Congress attempt to legislate the type of fruit and vegetable 
snacks to offer children when there's proof school food service professionals prefer the opportunity to vary the snacking menu to include all forms of fruits and vegetables. The guidelines for Americans emphasize the importance of across the board increase in fruit and vegetable intake and the recommendations specifically include fresh frozen canned and dried products. School nutritionists are key influencers in determining which healthy products children will consume under the various federal programs. It should be noted that many schools lack either the infrastructure to store or the ability to prepare many fresh products which can result in excessive waste and a nutritional and monetary loss. My I'm out of time. I thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. As you know, the House position is all forms. The Senate position is fresh only. I assume this will be determined in conference. Congressman Valadeo, I know you're a co-sponsor of the amendment. Thank you. The rest of you, I hope you sign on board, and I will thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Steve Summers will be next, and stepping up uh, will be Larry Salinas. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Summers. I live in Oakland, California. I'm here on behalf of the Alameda County Community Food Bank, and I'm here to talk about the SNAP portion of the Farm Bill. I'm here to uh, encourage you to um, expand this program uh, and not to cut it. Uh, I know from personal experience that SNAP is vital. Uh, to is the most important federal program in fighting hunger. I know this from my own personal experience when uh, I became homeless during the uh, Great Recession in 2008. Uh, SNAP benefits um, as a homeless person helped me to uh, make healthy choices in eating because they serve a lot of junk in the, in the shelter. Uh, after um, uh, 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 I got out of the shelter and I uh, um, found a job. Eventually that company closed. Uh, I was unemployed and uh, back on SNAP for a year. Um, having SNAP during that time um, helped me, uh, it enabled me not to make the choice between food and paying rent. Um, an extremely uh, vital program for me at the time. Um, I was able to secure work uh, but now um, in this recovery, of, I'm, I'm underemployed. I only work 20 hours a week, and even with that job, I still qualify for a certain amount of SNAP benefits, which uh, you know help me to put food on the table. Uh, so it's a very important program. Um, and even with the SNAP benefits that I get and my salary from my job, it's not exactly like I'm living the high life. I uh, look forward to having a conversation uh, sometime in the future to dispel a lot of myths about SNAP, who gets it, uh, how you get it, uh, and uh, just what it does, and uh, uh, things about fraud. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. Um, coming up after Larry Salinas will be um, Anthony Schur. Larry Salinas. Good morning, Chairman Conway and members of the committee. I'm Larry Salinas, the Executive Director of Governmental Relations at California State University, Fresno, in the Office of the President. And I'm here to talk, uh, take a different twist to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship in the field of agriculture. California State University, Fresno, or commonly known as Fresno State, is a 106-year-old institution. We have a living laboratory, 1,000-acre farm on our campus, about 100 miles south of here. And Larry, can you move a little closer sure. to the mic? They're having trouble sure. here. And we're encouraging the committee to look at language in the new Farm Bill that includes financial support for the development of new and innovative technologies that will keep U.S. agriculture competitive and economically viable for the foreseeable future. These technologies should include, but not limited to, robotics that ensure plant health, the harvesting of crops, the monitoring and management technologies necessary to optimize water and energy resources, and quality assurance technologies that provide safety in the food chain. Most universities today support incubators and accelerators that provide proven pathways from concept to commercial commercialization for new ideas conceived by faculty and students. And many of these campus-based programs are focused on food, energy, and the water nexus. Since its opening in 2007, California State University's wet lab, which is water, energy, and technology, has provided and launched a platform for water and energy and ag technology startups. And in fact, next month, 
we're going to launch the first in the Valley, Valley Ventures Accelerator, which will be a flagship of our growing innovative ecosystem, and this will be the first accelerator in the San Joaquin Valley. We've identified 10 startups. We'll be providing support from an academic and research perspective, and we encourage the committee to take a deeper look into this. It's critical that programs such as these receive a broad range of support from stakeholders such as you who have a vested interest in keeping U.S. agriculture as the leading supplier of food to our state, our nation, and our world. And in fact, recently, I believe, the California Farm Bureau was advocating in Washington, which included this topic on innovation and entrepreneurship. So I thank you very much for your time and interest. Well, you had that down, perfect timing. Um, so next we'll have uh, Anthony Shore, and coming up uh, after that, Frank Coelho. Anthony. Hi, I'm Tony Shore. I'm president of the California Aquaculture Association, and I'm here on behalf of our association and the National Aquaculture Association to encourage you, respectfully request, that aquaculture be included in the Farm Bill as a specialty crop. This designation would provide aquatic farmers with access to a, cr a number of critical USDA programs that would help thousands of aquaculture producers survive when disaster strikes and would improve their marketing and research capacity. California aquaculture, I represent oh, over 100 farmers and 1,000 jobs that produce a wide variety of species, shellfish uh, and fish, various species of fish, including sturgeon. You might be surprised that California is one of the global centers of caviar and sturgeon meat production, which was developed at the University of California at Davis, um, was, was uh, absolutely crucial to its development. Um, some people may think that uh, aquaculture is a strange specialty crop, but we probably rank in the top 10 of California uh, small, smaller crops, and uh, we produce about 150 to $200 million worth of product, depending on how you count the values and at what level. So we're, we're a substantial industry. We would like to be a much bigger industry if we had access to the Pacific Ocean. We would also encourage the committee to support uh, move a, a new aquaculture, uh, National Aquaculture Act, which is in development to replace the one that was passed in 1980, which is sadly out of date. As a, as a matter of fact, in California and in federal waters, there is almost no practical uh, means of a farmer getting a permit to farm fish in our very largest aquatic resource, the Pacific Ocean. So I, I hope that you will follow that and, and look at passage of that bill. How much I got? You're done. I'm done. Yep. <laughs> Went fast. Thank you. But again, I know two minutes goes really, really fast, but, and we'll put at the end your written comments, and the committee would really like to have those because then they can um, have that for the record as well, as well as these comments will go on the record. So we'll have Frank Quelo, and after that, Gene Brandy. Frank. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Frank Coelho. I am a third generation dairy farmer in the state of California. I've been organic for 20 years. And my, que my question today is what are you going to do about integrity of the organic dairy industry? Enforcement of the pasture rule is set by the ONSB and has been implemented nationwide and the, in the integrity of organic farming has been damaged, hurting organic dairy farmers. Organic state laws are not in line with the NOSB and are allowing large corporate da organic dairy farms in other states to exist without following pa pa federal pastoral rules and to jeopardize the federal rule. I understand that state taxes accrued by organic dairies is large, which may be the enforcement, it, why the enforcement is not non-existent. But states too must be held accountable and the large organic dairies must comply with federal rule. All organic dairies must be held equally to the same standard and rules, irregardless of certifiers, state or private. And those certifiers and inspectors must be held accountable to enforce the rules. I su support the OFRF as long as their research foundation works to support the implementation of federal pasture rules set forth by the NOSB. Thank you for your time. 
May I add that I praise the FFA and encourage the committee to keep the family farm alive. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so we'll have Jean Brandy and following that, Shanti Prasad. Jean? Good morning. Hi, I'm Jean Brandy. I'm a beekeeper from down the road in Los Banos, and I'm also the president of the American Beekeeping Federation. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to listen to, to, you can listen to our concerns uh, for the beekeeping industry in the USA. Our honeybees are not as healthy as they used to be. For us old timers to start keeping bees back in the 70s, we remember the good old days, and we just don't have that anymore. Um, our winter and annual losses are remaining at very high levels at this time. And there's been some recent survey results from USDA NAS indicate the nation's honeybee colony numbers are increasing slightly, but this is due to the hard work and dedication of the nation's beekeepers. Varroa mites, exposure to certain pesticides, inadequate nutrition, and certain diseases continue to, to take their toll on the nation's honeybees. We believe it is important that USDA and all federal agencies embrace the framework of the national strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. And we also believe that honeybees need to be specifically mentioned in the Farm Bill as allowed on all USDA conservation program lands. The U.S. Forest Service, BLM, and other federal agencies allow apiaries on some of their lands, and we believe that honeybees need access to clean, uncontaminated forage, um, and there, there are opportunities on federal lands that are currently not being uh, utilized, and we'd certainly like to see that uh, explored and expanded. The ABF also believes that there should be an increase in the cap on CRP acres, and that uh, the cap be raised to at least 40 million acres, and this would greatly benefit honeybees and other pollinators. Seed mixtures need to be reformulated in many cases to improve the value to pollinators uh, while significantly reducing the costs. ELAP, NAP, and federal crop insurance are helpful programs that provide a safety net for beekeepers and should be continued. And also, there's a new ARS facility, research facility at UC Davis that's ready to go, but it's not yet staffed. So we'd love to see that staffed so that those folks can uh, get to work on behalf of the bee industry. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. I would just say, too, I'm not sure how the committee can hear up here. I know from mine and maybe back there. Speak really close into the microphone because I think uh, I have some of the committee members said they're having a hard time hearing. You might be able to hear better out there, but I think the committee might, and it could be I ran too many tractors without hearing it uh, protection, but uh, we'll have Shante Prasad and then John Bedell. Good morning, Chairman Conaway and members of the House Ag Committee. I'm Shanti Prasad, uh, the Senior Policy Advocate at Alameda County Community Food Bank in Oakland and a Fresno, California native. Uh, at Alameda County Community Food Bank, we serve over 300,000 of the 1.5 million uh, Alameda County residents annually. Uh, I would like to first echo Stephen Summers' comments about the SNAP program. Um, in Alameda County, we serve, uh, uh, SNAP serves 112,000 people, 59% of those are children. Uh, it's, a, it's a vital program and I urge you to protect SNAP from any proposals to cut it or to alter its structure. Uh, it's designed to help people when they need it most and as the economy improves, fewer people are on the program. Currently, though, uh, food banks across the country are distributing more food than ever. We still only provide one emergency meal for every 19 meals that are provided by federal nutrition programs, mainly SNAP. So food banks would not be able to pick up the slack if there were a monetary cap and more people would be left food insecure, causing poor health and educational, poor educational outcomes and an increase in health costs. Uh, I also want to talk about another piece of the SNAP program for able-bodied adults without dependents. ABODs, as they're called, are restricted to three months of SNAP benefits within a three-year period unless that person satisfies the ABOD work requirements or meets an exemption. The ABOD population is a diverse group across gender, across age, and also across urban, suburban, and rural residences. Most are extremely poor at 29% of the federal poverty level. They are veterans. They are young adults who are just out of foster care trying to make it. In California, there are about 470,000 people who are on SNAP as part of the ABODs. Research shows that ABODs want to work. This time limit of three months and three years is unrealistic. 
The limit also doesn't recognize other barriers to employment, like chronic underemployment of under 20 hours a week despite looking for work, transportation, and lack of skills. States are allowed to apply for a waiver if they meet certain guidelines, and I urge you to keep this waiver. Uh, it's important to keep folks facing unemployment from being hungry, and actually helps them to keep looking for work. Cutting SNAP for ABODs would mean turning our back on a struggling population that needs more assistance, not less. Probably need to wrap up. Uh, I also want to share that SNAP, or food stamps as they were called in the 70s when my mom used them in Fresno, California, helped me to grow up without knowing what it is to be hungry, or worse, malnourished. I had consistent access to fresh, nutritious food, and this is because the SNAP program accomplished what it was there to do. I grew up healthy and was able to get an education and contribute to society. No one in this country should go hungry, and SNAP works, worked then, and it works now as the most efficient and effective anti-hunger program in America. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shanti. Um, next, we'll have John Bedell, and after that, Steve DeBrun. John. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Bedell. I'm Senior Director of Ag Operations at JS West Milling Company and past president of the Pacific Egg and Poultry Association. JS West was founded in 1908 by a native Nebraskan who moved to California to enjoy the slightly warmer weather and drier climate. Don't let anybody tell you it's hot in the Central Valley. It's a dry heat. So if everybody know that, we are made up of 300 employees. We operate in 22 counties in Northern California, and we produce shell eggs, liquid eggs, almonds, propane for agricultural, commercial, and residential operations. JS West is also active with the Association of California Egg Farmers, who is very interested in the language in the next farm bill as it pertains to something that's currently out there, HR 2887, the No Regulation Without Representation Act of 2017, which would impact not just California, but many other states in the nation. And doing some research, I found that 150 state statutes would be in effect in 46 different states, from Alaska to Florida, Maine to Hawaii, and the Dakotas to Texas. California has always had an excellence of being one of the best egg producing states with the safest eggs. Because of legislation passed by, by Californians, AB 1447, which states that all chickens in the state of California have to be vaccinated with Salmonella iteratus vaccine. And as we know, in the last 17 years, there has not been one incidence of egg related human salmonella iteratus. The California egg farmers have invested hundreds of millions of dollars to ensure that Californians have safe food. JS West alone has invested tens of millions of dollars in providing safe, affordable, wholesome food for California families and businesses and language like that in HR 20, uh, 2887 would undermine the food safety protecting 39 million Californians. On behalf of the Association of California Egg Farmers, JS West Milling Company and myself, I would like to committee to um, concern language about uh, 2287 in the next farm bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Maybe I butchered Steve's ne last name. I thought it was DeBrun, Mayor Manteca, DFA. Oh, there we go. Okay. And then after that, if we could have Mark Lipson come up, and the next mic be ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I represent Dairy Farmers of America. Uh, my first point, improving the margin protection program, restoring MPP to original proposal is vital for dairy farmers to have a viable and dependable safety net, which dairy, dairymen currently do not have. Without correcting key elements of the program, such premiums and coverage, dairymen as a whole will not be able to sign up for the program in future years because it does not work. MPP needs to be a program that will work when margins are significantly low. MPP is not a pro program to guarantee a profit, but to help save the equity in dairymen's farms. Dairy farmers need to have as many as risk management tools available to them as does any other commodity. There is no reason dairy, dairy should be precluded from assessing both the farm bill safety net programs and other government risk programs at the same time. We are currently a, a, having labor challenges. Dairy farmers support efforts to reform our immigration system to make sure our country has more secure and more effective for businesses in need of workers. Without access to our current worker visa program, despite specific requests from MP, uh, National Milk uh, Producer Federation, the Department of Labor has turned down accesses to H-2VA visa programs and the difficulty to define higher wages and benefits dairy needs. 
comprehensive immigration reform that takes account into the needs to protect current programs and create access to future programs to the needs of our dairy farmers. The importance of trade, NAFTA is critical to the access and success of the dairy industry. We must protect from what we have in Mexico and challenges and candidates to efforts to distort trade. Dairy exports are a key to our future success already, and we export more than one day a week of U.S. milk production abroad. We need to advance a strong trade agenda and will help the dairy business expand. In terms of the dairy pride, dairy farmers work hard to meet the dairy standards required by U.S. FDA with, with the products of butter, milk, yogurt, and ice cream. Dairy imitators should not be able to ignore current law and use these terms. The FDA must enforce existing regulations. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. Uh, Mark Lipson will be up next, and then behind that, uh, Marler Livingood, I think, if I see her, or Lindengood. I can't, I may have butchered that, so I'm sorry, from the California Strawberry Commission. But next, Mark. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning. Uh, representatives, thanks for being here in California. My name is Mark Lipson. I've been an organic farmer over on the coast due west to here since 1983. Proudly certified by California Certified Organic Farmers. I'm also the uh, former chair of the California Organic Products Advisory Commission and I served in the uh, under Secretary Vilsack as the USDA Organic Policy Advisor. Uh, my honor to serve there with uh, Secretary Ross. I want to start out as uh, just saying on behalf of organic farmers, solidarity with all farmers is a very important part of how we try to interact with the policy world and, and with the, all the various sectors in agriculture. I served on the Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau Board for a number of years uh, when I was a younger farmer. Today I'm representing the Organic Farming Research Foundation. I'm the senior policy specialist there, which is a national organization dedicated to the improvement and widespread adoption of organic agriculture through education and research primarily. We fund research. We're a grant maker. Uh, for over 25 years, OFRF has been working with Congress and USDA to build the capacity for organic research and extension nationally. We uh, played a major role in the creation of USDA's flagship organic research program, the Organic Research and Extension Initiative, which has been part of the Farm Bill with mandatory funding since 2002. From uh, Chico to Lubbock, OREI has built a strong, uh, an outstanding research capacity and track record of performance for organic research all over the country for all different kinds of organic production and processing. Um, the uh, importance of preserving that capacity can't be overstated. My time is already up. Uh, I'll just say I support what Mr. Coelho said about enforcement of organic. There are a number of other uh, needs for improvement of the enforcement and oversight of the organic trade. We're very happy to work with the committee on that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up, we'll have Marla Livingood, and after that, Ken Heck. Ken Heck. Good Marla. morning. I'm Marla Livingood with the California Strawberry uh, Commission. Really close. Really close. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Commission represents California's farmers, processors, and shippers of strawberries. Growing on less than one half of 1% of California's farmland, our farmers grow nearly 90% of the nation's strawberries. They generate an estimated 70,000 farm jobs, and they contribute $3 billion to rural communities. I want to take a minute to highlight a couple of programs which support strawberry production that are in the Farm Bill. The Market Access Program is a program that provides federal matching funds to promote and expand exports. In 2016, California strawberries gained access to the China market. MAP funding has been crucial in exporting U.S. strawberries to China, a market which has the potential to grow to 30 million in the next few years. Another program which benefits strawberries is the Specialty Crop Research Initiative. For example, California strawberry, the California Strawberry Commission recently supported a UC Santa Cruz request 
to develop effective biofumigation treatments to reduce soil-borne disease. In addition, we've, re we've supported a request to identify disease-resistant strawberry gene. In addition to this research, a priority for the Commission is labor-saving automation. And we believe that the Farm Bill represents an opportunity to dedicate some funding within SCRI to automation. Lastly, the school nutrition program has purchased nearly 50 million pounds of strawberries from California growers. In FY, or this program is important to both con to farmer customers and important in promoting healthy eating and nutrition for children. And we ask that you continue these programs in the next Farm Bill, and we thank you for your time. Thank you, Marla. Uh, next, we'll have Ken Hecht, and after that, uh, Lily Kirby. Good morning. Ken. I'm Ken Hecht, Director of Policy at the University of California's Nutrition Policy Institute. We're a part of this Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, I have an offer, an observation, and a recommendation. First, the offer. The Nutrition Policy Institute uh, contains about 30 researchers, all focused on food and nutrition, with a particular focus on the federal food programs, and within that, on SNAP and on the SNAP education program. If we can be of any assistance to the committee, we'd like to be so. The observation. SNAP-Ed is minuscule. It is less than 1% of the SNAP program but we'd like you to think of it as value added. The purpose of SNAP-Ed is to help people make healthy decisions on purchases of food and enable them to uh, prepare and consume healthy food. Given the cost to the nation, as well as the cost to individuals of obesity and, and food insecurity, it seems to us a very good investment to help people get the most that they can out of their SNAP benefits. The recommendation. Our research has shown that uh, next to cost, accessibility is the biggest barrier for people's wanting to get healthy food, particularly for seniors, particularly for disabled, and for people who live in a neighborhood without any supermarket where transportation may not be available. That is a serious barrier to getting healthy food. USDA is conducting a pilot program, which you may be aware of, uh, in seven sites using uh, online purchasing and, uh, and payment for food for SNAP participants. And we'd urge you to keep an eye on that and consider making that a permanent part of the SNAP program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Uh, next, uh, then we'll have uh, Lily Kirby, and coming up after that, Jeff Stump. Lily. Hi, my name is Lily Kirby. <clears throat> I'm from Davis, California, and I'm a volunteer with the Humane Society. Uh, animal welfare is especially important to me, so I hope that you will work to strengthen animal welfare measures when drafting the new farm bill. Also, the Dog and Cat Meat Trade Prohibition Act, or H.R. 1406, was referred to the Agricultural Committee and amends the Animal Welfare Act to prohibit the domestic slaughter trade and important import export of dogs and cats for human consumption. It establishes penalties for individuals involved in the dog or cat meat trade and prevents the dog and cat meat trade from taking hold in the US while strengthening our country's standing to press for reform worldwide. Representative Denham is a co-sponsor of this legislation and I appreciate your support, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jeff Stump, and after that, Alicia Rockwell. Jeff. Thank you, good morning. My name is Jeff Stump. I'm the Director of Conservation for the Marin Agricultural Land Trust, MALT, also known as MALT. MALT is formed in 1980 as the first organi organization of its kind. It's a partnership between farmers and conservationists that work to protect agricultural land in our county. As of today, MALT protects 80 family farms and ranches on more than 48,000 acres in our county, but the need is still great due to development pressure and escalating land values. Our success is not measured just in acres and in farms, but in permanence and stability that has brought to our agricultural lands, 
due in large part to the commitment to long-term monitoring and enforcement and support of place-based conservation practices. Malt has partnered with NRCS to protect eight family farms in the county, more than, than 5,500 acres of land, and has helped us leverage significant local, state, and private funding for these programs. Protecting land is only the first step. Uh, Malt works closely with our resource conservation districts and our NRCS conservationists to assist landowners with projects through the EQUIP program. These projects deliver significant public benefit while, produce, while helping our producers be more resilient to drought and change market conditions. I hope you'll continue to support that vital program, also ensuring that NRCS has the staff to make the program work. As our time is limited today, I'm going to give you three specific recommendations that would improve the agricultural conservation uh, easement program in our country, um, in our county, and across America. First, please, we're asking you to authorize the funding for the agricultural conservation easement program at a minimum of $500 million per year. As you probably know, the base funding for this current fiscal year will be half of that and is likely to result in less than 7% of the applications from families to protect their farms being funded. A, a critical level of base funding is necessary to meet the demands of our fam family farms as, he, as they seek to stay in agriculture. Second, we ask that you revise the, land easement, the agricultural land easement program minimum terms to well, allow more flexibility in the program for partners like Malt uh, so we can use local tools to meet local conditions. And then lastly, really quickly, please, we ask you that you, you remove the agricultural land easement plan requirement, which is a burden to landowners and to easement holders um, as it requires implementation of practices without funding for them. So thank you for your time, and we'll submit a, a longer list of comments to the record. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. Uh, next, we'll hear from Alicia Rockwell, and after that, um, Denise Hunt. Good morning, Chairman and Congressional Committee members. Uh, my name is Alicia Rockwell. Uh, Blue Diamond Growers is a 107-year-old nonprofit brand cooperative owned by over half of California's almond farmers, averaging around 50 acres. They are small, multi-generational families. International trade is vital to U.S. agriculture. It needs to be a priority in the Farm Bill. Almonds are the number one exported specialty crop in the U.S. and the number one agricultural export in California. The Market Access Program is a critical tool in maintaining export markets. In light of our stalled trade policy, the U.S. is being left behind and almonds are facing great disadvantage at the worst time with estimated supply increases in coming years to be over 2.6 billion. An increased investment in maps could help offset lost trade momentum by keeping new innovative products in foreign markets, driving consumer awareness and consumption. Currently, Blue Diamond is in over 90 countries around the world. It is requested that MAP funding be increased to 400 million. This is essential to keeping our export markets. Our competitors are spending much more than this right now. The EU spends more on wine promotion than the entire MAP program, as an example. The MAP increase benefits all commodities exported. The increase would be $40 million per year for 10 years. The Specialty Crop Farm Bill Alliance also supports this increase. The Foreign Ag Service Office of Trade Promotions publishes an annual success story report. In the 2016 report under horticultural products, nuts, and other, U.S. tree nut exports reach $7.6 billion, and almonds represent over half of all U.S. nut exports at $4.3 billion. As the only branded cooperative in this category, the success of our products into foreign markets can be directly measured by increased consumption and sales, providing a great benefit to the entire almond industry. With the support of the MAP program, BDG's efforts are an essential strategy to serve the U.S. almond farmers who have made these investments at home. Additionally, the technical assistance for specialty crops program needs to be maintained at the $9 million level. While not within committee's jurisdiction, it is critical that this committee encourage the House to adopt legislation that provides for a legal ag workforce. Without a legal workforce, U.S. ag will continue to shrink and in some cases disappear. Our cows need 
to be milked every day, all year long, and perishable crops need to be harvested when they're ripe and not later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alicia. And again, uh, any additional comments we can always put on, we'll have that website at the end where you can send that. So next will be Denise Hunt, and after that, John Unruh. Denise? Good morning. Thank you for being here. I've lived in Stanislaus County since 1973, and I'm proud to be a Valley resident in one of the richest agricultural regions of our country and the world. I've been privileged to serve for several years as a Children and Families Commissioner in Stanislaus County. In California, these county commissions are responsible for administering funds from tobacco, ta from tobacco taxes for services to very young children ages 0 to 5 and their families. I've come to know about the effects of food insecurity. Many families in this county and region have periods every year when they can't afford to put enough food on the table. There are real consequences to this, especially for our children. Food insecure kids have increased rates of developmental and mental health problems. They have problems with cognitive development and they have slowed or stunted growth. These problems in turn have impacts on behavioral, social, and educational development, leading to growing costs down the line. In Stanislaus County, 21.8% or 31,320 of our kids are, are estimated to be living below the poverty level. In San Joaquin County, 19.8% or 38,766 of our kids are living below the poverty level. That's 70,000 children. That's almost the total population of Turlock, the city that I live in. It gets worse the further south you go. With Fresno County alone, having more than 68,500 children living in poverty. I don't need to tell all of you from that, all, I, I really don't need to tell all, all of you that because I know some of you are from counties south of here. So we know that this is what we face in one of the leading agri agricultural regions in our county and the world. As you move toward developing and finalizing a 2018 farm bill, I'm asking you today not to decrease SNAP or food stamp funding, not to decrease school nutrition and summer food service programs, and especially not to even consider moving to block grant funding for nutrition programs. We all know block grant funding leads to significant program service reductions going forward. Please take the opportunity your positions afford you to keep our children from going hungry. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Denise. We'll now hear from John Unruh, and after that, uh, Ryan Cousin. John. Good morning. Uh, as dean, I am here today on behalf of the College of Agriculture, California State University, Chico. Chico State is a comprehensive Hispanic-serving institution, university located in the North State with an enrollment of over 17,000 students. Over the past, past five years, our college has experienced over 40% growth with over 920 undergraduates expected this fall. Our focus is on student success and preparing students for careers in agriculture and also applied research that will advance California agriculture. Our 800 acre farm and agriculture facilities are key to providing students with experiential learning opportunities and conducting applied research. As the House Committee of Agriculture begins to draft a new farm bill, I ask that you please look to reauthorize and reinvest in the following programs important to America's 60 non-land grant colleges of agriculture, the California State University's four campuses with colleges of agriculture, and the California State University's Agriculture Research Institute. They include non-land grant colleges of agriculture, McIntyre Stennis Capacity Grant, Hispanic Serving Institutions Educational Grants, Hispanic Serving Agriculture Colleges and Universities, Specialty Crop Research Initiative, Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, and Agriculture College Infrastructure Improvement Program. In the interest of time, I'd like to just spend a few words with the Agriculture College Infrastructure Improvement Program. Uh, we seek authorization for a new Agriculture Infrastructure Improvement Program to support construction and deferred maintenance of agriculture college research facilities, farms, and classrooms. Fatil facilities are in bad need of attention, both for construction of new capital projects and for tackling the backlog of deferred maintenance of existing facilities. Deferred maintenance alone uh, 
in a detailed commission uh, is estimated to be $8.4 billion in 2015. With this, the strat this strategy does align with federal efforts to invest in America's infrastructure and a means of strengthening our economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, we'll hear from Ryan Cousins, and after that, if uh, Claire Brumley could come up. Ryan. Uh, good morning. Ryan Cousins, uh, here representing the American Honey Producers Association. My family also farms almonds for about the past 40 years in Madeira, and uh, we've been beekeeping for about 12 years. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Denham for co-chairing the Pollination Caucus in the House, and for all you have done to bring attention to this issue. And to you, Mr. Chairman, for your recent statements acknowledging the challenges we face and committing to work towards solutions in the Farm Bill. Honeybee health is still a major, in major jeopardy with annual losses up to 45% according to USDA. And this, 10 years after identifying most of our major issues. Our, our bees are responsible for pollinating 20 billion in agricultural output. Recent news about improvements in honeybee health are overblown. Even if colony loss numbers are slightly better year over year, those numbers do not account for the substantial practice changes and input costs we are bearing as an industry. The truth is that anything over 15% is a challenge for us. We have a long way to go. Pollinated crops like almonds will continue to be at risk if we cannot get both colony numbers and colony vitality back up. There is no replacement for the honeybee. In this farm bill, the American Honey Producers Association is calling for Increased cap in the ELAP program, since we are currently only collecting pennies on the dollar with a 20 million program limit. More conservation program acreage into affordable and large scale honeybee plantings. More coordinate, coordinated research for honeybee health with ARS, NIFA, and all other USDA agencies so that longitudinal field research can be done to identify causes and more importantly, find solutions for the commercial beekeepers. Bottom line, whether pesticides, mites, or habitat are the primary cause of our plight, we need to continue to live within the agricultural community. We are not looking for solutions that benefit us to someone else's detriment. But serious efforts need to be taken, take place if we are to find a way to both protect crops and the pollinators like honeybees. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Next, we'll hear from Claire Brumley, and after that, Milton O'Hare. Claire. Good morning. My name is Claire Brumley, and I'm a VP Lending with American Ag Credit, part of the Farm Credit System. American Ag Credit specializes in providing financial services to agricultural and rural customers throughout California, Nevada, Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico. Financial services provided by American Ag Credit include production and mortgage financing, equipment and vehicle leasing, crop and life insurance, and lines of credit. We also have programs that help serve young, beginning, and small farmers. I was born and raised here in the Central Valley and continue to be part of my family farm operations that currently produces almonds and walnuts. Our family farm has utilized financing from American Ag Credit and its predecessors for over 30 years, initially for land acquisition, then again when transitioning from grain crops to permanent plantings. We have always found American Ag Credit to be one of the most secure sources of long-term financing. Dealing with people from American Ag Credit has always included the benefit of many of the employees being dedicated professionals who not only know, but have lived agriculture. The family farm has utilized services from the University of California Extension in planning and developing orchards, especially in regards to information relative to nutrient management and water management. We've also utilized the services of the Natural Resources Control Service by participating in programs to retire equipment no longer environmentally sound and in improving our irrigation systems. The farm has participated in the crop insurance program for many years. After watching hail obliterate our rice crop in the mid-90s with our crop insurance, we were still able to make our loan payments and move forward. The crop insurance program continues to provide a safety net and preserve the family farm in the event of a disaster. American Ag Credit, along with the farm credit system, supports passage of a strong farm bill in 2018. Our priorities include strengthening the federal crop insurance program, expanding the Farm Service Agency direct and guaranteed loan program, 
and boosting in investment in rural infrastructure. Along with these remarks, I am providing for the record further details on each one of these issues. Thanks again for coming out to California, and we look forward to working with the committee as you continue to craft the next Farm Bill. Thank you, Claire. Next, we'll hear from Milton O'Hare, and after that, Larry Hun. No? Good, mor good morning, uh, Chairman Conaway and distinguished members of the House Committee on Agriculture. My name is Milton O'Hare, and I'm the Stanislaus County Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer of Weights and Measures. Welcome to Stanislaus County, the home of the largest almond acreage in the nation. Agriculture is the number one industry and lifeblood of the county. Over 35% of the jobs are related to agriculture, and we produce over 250 different crops and livestock. And along with the rest of California, we supply the U.S. and the world with fresh produce. However, this precious resource is under constant threat from invasive insects hitchhiking aboard cargo or brought in by unsuspecting travelers. One of the best ways to combat this invasive, these invasive insects is through an early warning system. Stanislaus County deploys and services over 6,000 invasive insect traps that serve as an early warning system by detecting species that are harmful to agriculture. The outcome is significant cost savings as early detection avoids the high cost of a long-term management program. It also helps to maintain access to international markets for U.S. plant products. Since the early 2000s, Stanislaus County has detected various insects that could have proven detrimental to our local and state agriculture industry if not found at an early stage. In Invasive pests found in, in the county include red imported fire ant, guava fruit fly, glass wing sharpshooter, light brown apple moth, and Asian citrus psyllid. We employ 20 seasonal staff to service these traps, and a portion of the program's cost is covered with funding from the USDA funded through the biological pest and disease management provisions of the Farm Bill. I urge Congress to, con to continue adequate support for these provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill. Thank you for coming to our county and for the opportunity to make these comments this morning. Thank you, Milton. Uh, next, we'll hear from Larry Hun and then Tim Schultz after that. Larry? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Hun. I'm a fourth generation um, owner operator of a diversified family farm in the Sacramento Delta. I'm here presently. Um, presently representing the California Association of Wheat Growers and the California Wheat Commission. I'm glad to hear from the uh, chairman that you're going to expedite this uh, farm bill. Like last time, it was delayed for two years. So I'm pleased to hear that we're going to try to move that forward quicker. Uh, we growers, we growers are suffering right now. We're some of the historical low prices, and so the FMD and the MAP program are vitally important. Nearly half of the wheat in the nation has to be exported, and U.S. wheat presently takes $10 million and utilizes those funds in those programs. The return on that investment for every dollar, $28 come back in export enhancement. So that, that those programs are vitally important to us. Um, crop insurance is also too uh, important. Um, there's been talk of uh, in, uh, reducing the AGI limit, and there's some talk of uh, putting a forty thousand uh, on the subsidy for the insurance. I think what would happen is you would have many farmers not uh, buy crop insurance, and then we'll go back to the old system where when there was a disaster. You'd go back to Congress and apply for a disaster payment, and I don't think we want to do that. I think it would be better to have crop insurance. So those, are the, those things should stay the same. Um, the other is uh, agricultural research is also vitally important. I don't know if you're familiar with the $9.7 million that was granted to the NEFA program. That's being headed by George Sukoski, who is a renowned researcher at UC Davis. It's vitally important that we continue uh, to develop new uh, varieties. Uh, presently, 65% uh, of the varieties that we have are being developed by the public uh, program, so that's vitally important. 
If you're a true believer in global warming, uh, climate change, we're ultimately going to have to adapt to uh, these conditions, and varieties are the way to do it. Um, the other thing also, too, is uh, we'd we'll like to, to keep up. the nutrition title and the uh, farm program together. It's vitally important. I think uh, we need to have support from both the urban or urban members and, and the rural members, and I think that's probably one program that we can all kind of get together and agree on. The PL480 PL program, uh, the uh, Food for Peace, um, is important to us also. Um, it's a way uh, we can uh, move some of this SX, excess product uh, off into the world and, and feed hungry, hungry people. Um, there had been some talk about uh, we'll eliminating, that, eliminating yeah. that 480 program and, and just giving money. I think that's, that's the wrong way. We want to give the food, not money. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, two minutes goes fast. I apologize for that, but we have a stack here, and I know that the uh, chairman and the committee want to hear as many as they can. Next, we'll have Tim Schultz up, and then Dave Pippen. Tim. Good morning. My name is Tim Schultz. I'm with Lundberg Family Farms, a third-generation uh, family business. We're the country's leading supplier of organic rice and quinoa. This past year, sales of organic food products exceeded 5% of total food sales in the United States. Organic is one of the few growing segments in the overall food industry. In California is the organic capital with nearly 4,800 certified organic operations that produce 40% of all of the organic farm sales in the country. In the next farm bill, we have several priorities, but I'd like to focus today on three of them. Funding for the Organic Research Extension Initiative, annual funding support of the National Organic Program, and one-time funding to improve NOP's enforcement tools. Mark Lipson addressed the success of OREI, and we're requesting that this research funding be increased to $50 million annually to support continued growth of the organic sector. NOP is charged with maintaining and enforcing the rules and regulations for organic products. We're asking NOP receive full funding at current levels and grow at the same rate the industry is growing, which is currently about 10% per year. Finally, we need one-time funding of $5 million for the NOP to eliminate paper documents, and move to electronic import certificates to ensure full traceability of organic products throughout the complex global supply chain. Along with this, the NOP needs increased authority to ensure effective oversight, robust investigations, and enforcement across the entire supply chain. Organic agriculture brings economic benefits to rural America, enables beginning farmers to have sustainable operations, and provides great tasting, nutritious food to our consumers. Thank you for considering organic priorities in the next Farm Bill. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next up, we'll have Dave Pippen and then uh, Melissa Cannon. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Dave Pippen. I represent a third generation member of Travail and Pippen, a family far almond farming partnership located in Ripon, California. And it's my understanding that a few of you had the pleasure of meeting my son-in-law, yet the fourth generation member of Travail and Pippen. I hope you noted while you were there the over 65 family farmers that assist us in our operations and depend on our industry for their well-being. Uh, I'm also honored and privileged to be elected for a number of years now to the Almond Board of California, and I want to testify to you that the Almond Board has been a recipient of market access funding for a number of years while, uh, while I've been on the board and, and previously, and I want to testify to you that we have effectively used that to assist and help the over 6,000 almond growers throughout the state of California in moving over 70% of those tasty, nutritious, crunchy almonds to foreign markets all over the globe. This, uh, this program has been uh, wildly effective, and we recommend that you consider increasing the funding for this uh, uh, very important uh, market opportunity. I also want to testify you on the local level that our organization, the Travell and Pippin Family Partnership, has utilized EQIP funding for a number of our non-compliant farm machinery operations, and the, that program is very effective, well used. I've seen many of my neighbors availing themselves of that opportunity. This, uh, California is well renowned now for the drought, but I think less people realize the very strict air restrictions we have in, in the uh, Central Valley, and so it's very difficult to comply. Lastly, I want to also urge you to continue funding for the specialty crop insurance. Our organization, again, uh, insures 100% of our operation under crop insurance. 
We are funded 100% for over 30 years by the local farm credit, American Ag Credit now, and it's a huge risk mitigation measure and I think very effectively used not only by those who finance uh, California agriculture, but those who are being financed. Thank you very much for your consideration of these three things. Thank you, Dave. I think you set a record for getting a lot in in just under two minutes. Well done. Uh, Melissa Cannon will be up next, and after that, Andy Souza. Good morning. My name is Melissa Cannon, and um, Modesto is my um, hometown, so I'm happy to be here today. SNAP is one of our country's most vital nutrition programs, our primary defense against hunger, and I urge you to continue to support SNAP as the Agricultural Committee has done strongly over previous farm bills. Um, it was here in Modesto, California that my family first had to rely on SNAP. We fell into poverty um, almost overnight. My father went to prison. We lost everything. We lost our home. Um, we lost the primary breadwinner for our family. My mother, who was a single or a stay-at-home mom, had to enter the workforce. It took a while for her to find a job after not worked for 10 years. She eventually found a position um, really just up the road here as a maid, but making barely over minimum wage. SNAP is one of those programs that helped me to have a somewhat normal childhood despite what we went through. It helped to keep me fed. It helped to put food on the table. It helped to give me the ability to concentrate and focus on school, to give me um, a chance to provide a future for myself that didn't rely on the choices that my father made. And so I am eternally grateful for programs like SNAP. It has helped me to get to where I am today. I am now an advocate for healthy food for low-income Californians at the California Food Policy Advocates. My brother, he's another success story. He's now making a six-figure salary as a financial advisor at Charles Schwab. My sister works just up the road here at the Sierra Conservation Center as a corrections officer. She just bought her first home. SNAP helped us get there, and I urge you to continue to support SNAP in the Farm Bill. And for the 4.3 million Californians that depend on SNAP, it's vital that we continue the benefits at their current level. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. We'll next hear from Andy Souza, and after that, Kathy Hagee, I believe. But Forgive me if I'm pronouncing it right. H-U-Y-G-H-E. Andy. Good morning, Andy Souza, CEO of the Community Food Bank. Um, it's kind of tough following Melissa's story, but we, um, we are the primary food access source for the southern five counties of San Joaquin Valley, Madera, Fresno, Tulare, Kings, and Kern counties. We currently serve about 280,000 people every month, and we have recently, over the last four years, doubled the amount of food we distribute from just under 20 million to just over 40 million pounds of food a year. Included in that 40 million pounds is 20 million pounds of fresh produce thanks to the very generous ag region that we live in. But yet with all of that and all that's being done, um, the stories like Melissa's uh, duplicate rapidly. We, we are facing a hunger epidemic in our portion of the valley. Our unemployment rate is just over 9%, which is twice the national average. We have uh, poverty rates between 25 and 28% in each of our counties. We have one in four adults and one in three children that are going hungry every month. This is very real, and it's very real on a daily basis to families like Melissa's and the very people we serve at the food bank. SNAP is a huge component of what we do. It's a huge part of the line of defense that we serve between families going hungry and families being productive in our communities. Uh, we know, as Shanti shared earlier, the amount that, that we can't possibly make up <clears throat> at the food bank what's going to be lost with any potential cuts in SNAP. It's critical to the families we serve. It's critical to the communities we serve in. We've had the pleasure, excuse me, of Representative Valadeo coming to multiple distributions. And we make a distribution out to a community, a rural communities in Fresno County. We load up our truck in the warehouse, we drive out there, we deliver the food, families are served. It's critical, it's important to those very families. But it has minimal, if any, economic impact to those communities. SNAP impact is to every one of those communities. When folks receive that SNAP benefit, they're purchasing those meals right there in that community. They're helping employ the clerk the bag where everybody in that local supermarket is being employed because of the value of SNAP. So we would ask that as you go into your deliberations, we know you've heard a lot of competing interests, but we know that for the very future of our valley, SNAP is critical to that. And we'd like to ask you to consider 
maintaining the funding that's in place, and as was previously mentioned, please do not consider block granting. We know that there's certainly uh, ramifications that, that are far beyond um, the initial discussion. So I want to thank you again for your time, for being here, and we will also be submitting written comments. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Next up will be Kathy and then uh, Piper Kressel. Good morning. Yeah. I'm Kathy Hoyha. I'm the founder of a company called Enolytics, which brings big data and business intelligence to the wine and spirits industry. You may have heard that the exports of American wine, and particularly California wine, as reported in the last two weeks, has dropped precipitously, um, despite quantitative evidence of increasing consumer interest around the world. I would like to suggest that we can do better, and the technology and the language exists for us to do better. Since 2014, I've been researching uh, for the Congressional Wine Caucus uh, where USDA funding goes, especially in relation to the market access program. I would like to respectfully re suggest that um, it can be used a lot more strategically and a lot more efficiently. The, um, as I said, the language uh, related to this topic, related to the use of data exists currently in the current iteration of the Farm Bill, um, specifically in relation, in fact, to the SNAP program. Uh, there is awareness that data and business intelligence is a strategic and effective use of, of funding. Uh, this conversation started earlier this year for me with uh, Congressman Mark Hurd from Texas and his uh, staff, uh, including Caleb Crosswhite, who encouraged me to come today and bring this potential to you. Um, I actually live in Atlanta, so I may be the farthest one away um, to come today, but I believe in it very much. I believe very much in the possibility of data to use better government funding to help wineries and spirits producers in particular market their wine abroad. I believe that it's possible to improve the perception of U.S. wines globally. And I think that data is one of the ways, the smart and efficient use of data is one of the ways that we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Next, we'll have Piper, and after that, Karen Burr. Piper. Good morning. My name is Piper Kressel. I yeah. might take two minutes for me to get this low enough. <laughs> can you hear me? Good, uh, good morning. My name is Piper Kressel. I'm from Rockland, California. I Rockland, California. Is that better? And I am a senior district leader for the Humane Society of the United States volunteer program. And I'm here to ask you today to include animal welfare in the reforms in the 2018 Farm Bill currently under review. The completed Farm Bills in the last 15 years have all included animal welfare provisions. And the animal welfare getting such currency with every sector of the American public, the Agriculture Committee should be doing more on this topic. The USDA enforces our federal laws related to animal welfare, and these are the bills in Congress, and there are bills in Congress that strengthen enforcement relating to the USDA. Therefore, they relate to your committee. One of those bills, known as H.R. 909, is the Pet and Women's Safety Act. This bill has 231 House co-sponsors. It protects battered partners and their pets by extending current federal domestic violence protection to include pets and authorizes a small amount of grant money to help domestic violence shelters accommodate pets or arrange for shelter. This bill also authorizes very modest funding of $3 million per year to deal with a real and acute problem. It is assigned to the Agriculture Committee, and I know that Representative Denham is a lead co-sponsor of this bill, so I'd like to thank him for his humane leadership. We look forward to working with you and beside you on these important issues. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Piper. Uh, next, we'll have Karen Burr, and following Karen will be John Duarte. Karen. Good morning. <clears throat> Karen Burr, I'm the Executive Director of the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, and I represent the 98 RCDs here in the state, as well as their boards, which are primarily made up of ran uh, farmers and ranchers. Uh, we have four very simple asks for you this morning. The first is that in order to maintain strong agriculture and rural economies in California, that you maintain the Farm Bill at least at its current levels, if not reverting back to previous levels in the Farm Bill. Second, uh, we ask that you maintain the conservation title 
especially here in California, the conservation title is really critical to assisting farmers and ranchers in maintaining their properties, uh, their agricultural businesses, and also in being able to comply with regulation. Technical assist assistance is also a very critical part of this given the diversity of landscapes and the diversity of crop types here in California, and we hope that you'll maintain the technical assistance provided to farmers and ranchers. And then finally, given the current uh, crisis that we have in the Sierras, we hope that you'll maintain the forestry title uh, and keep uh, funding strong there so that we can help to repair our Sierra Nevadas. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Karen. Uh, now we'll hear from John Dewarty, and following John, John Kautz. Hello, Chairman, Congressman Denham, Congressman LaMalfa, Valadeo, Congressman Evans. Thank you for being here. I've met with all of you back, back in Washington, D.C. I'm John Dewarty from Dewarty Nursery. We produce trees and vines. We employ about 600 people on average throughout the year here in Modesto. And I'd really like to be talking to you today about the Clean Plant Network and plant importation, health, and exotic pest issues, which the Farm Bill's done a great job addressing, but that's not, unfortunately, my priority right now. I am being sued by the Army Corps of Engineers and Department of Justice for planting wheat in a wheat field. Congressman Denham and Mamalfa, you've both been to the property. You've seen the truth of what the facts are on that site. A major priority of this Farm Bill absolutely needs to be to clarify protections of far right to farm from regulatory overreach. We have found that Army Corps of Engineers did not even have subject matter jurisdiction to bring this case against my company and myself, yet it's already cost us $3 million in legal expenses and threatens the existence of our company here in Modesto. We've got the Congress, we've got the Senate, we've got a president who's voiced very clear support for farmers' rights to farm. This case shows that food security in America is threatened by the progressive regulatory government power agenda. That should be a major focus in this year's Farm Bill. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, John Couts, and following John will be Steve Schwartz. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. John Couts, uh, past president of the State Board of Food and Ag. Uh, had the honor of doing many things, growing many crops. First, two items that I'd like to discuss. First, the fight that John DeWarty is putting on for our benefit, all of us. We all need to jump in and help solve that problem because the outcome of that event is going to definitely affect all of agriculture. So I highly urge you to support any of the actions that we can do. The second item that I'd like to talk about is the endangered species. The endangered species is a cast cow for a lot of the environmentalist organizations. An example, the elderberry, longhorned elderberry beetle, three years ago was listed to be delisted as endangered, and we still haven't got it done. It is, it is ridiculous that we're leaving so many of these items that are being de devastating to agriculture, and we need to clean them up while we have the opportunity, and let's get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, John. We'll next hear from Steve Schwartz, and following that, Bob Elliott. Steve. Good morning. Good morning. I'm speaking on behalf of the California Caucus of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, which is the state's leading sustainable agriculture and organic organizations. We have 15 groups representing over 50,000 stakeholders. Um, first, I want to thank, be, thank the California members of the delegation for the work, the cooperative work in the last Farm Bill cycle and say that I'm looking forward to working with you all in the next time. Um, NSAC has over 100 groups around the country, including members in Texas and Pennsylvania. Our caucus priorities include the working lands conservation programs like EQIP, um, specialty crop block grant programs, soil health initiatives, organic research programs, and food safety programs. But I want to take, I want to make uh, two points here. First, first about programs without baseline. You know, Congress has invested over a billion dollars into the last Farm Bill to support a more sustainable food and farming system through several programs for which pro pro funding will dry up next year due to last lack of 
baseline. So we really urge you to do everything you can to get this job done in 2018. We saw what happened last time. It affected a lot of California farmers and others around the state, around the country. Um, second one is, you know, we all, we, we've heard rumors that it's kind of a very partisan uh, climate back in D.C., but we all know that agriculture is a nonpartisan issue. And what I would say is the last five farm bills, none of them have gone forward without clear support from both sides of the aisle, significant votes on both. So we know we're going to need bipartisan support, and I, and I want to commend the California members here today who have a history of demonstrating that they will vote their conscience, vote their district, even when it's going against party leadership on certain issues of agriculture and, and food. Um, and I hope that you'll step up early to be champions on marker bills. We know we're going to need bipartisan support at the end of the road. Let's do it early and show that leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We'll now hear from Bob Elliott, and after Bob, we'll have Janae DaCosta. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Conway, uh, distinguished members of the panel. I'm Bob Elliott, County Supervisor, San Joaquin County. Agriculture is the number one industry in San Joaquin County, so it's certainly in our best interest to support it and protect it as much as we can. Uh, we've already heard from several members of San Joaquin County uh, this morning, so I won't repeat what they have said, but I would like to make just a couple of points. Uh, first, in general, uh, any severe cuts to our specialty crops would certainly have a detrimental effect to our agriculture here, especially in terms of pest exclusion and pest detection programs. So I would uh, urge your continued support for that type of program. Along those lines, funding for the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service is critical. This uh, defends our animal and plant resources from agricultural pests and diseases, and one great example is the Mediterranean fruit fly, which uh, could be devastating if it's not controlled. So I would certainly urge you to continue support for these programs in the Farm Bill, and I thank you for being here today to listen to these concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I hope I didn't butcher somebody's name. Is it Janae or Jeanette? Janet DaCosta Driscolls? See them. We'll go on with uh, Nelia Alamo, and then after that, Lupe uh, Lopez. Lupe. Nelia. Good morning. Um, my name is Nelia Alamo. I am director of marketing and communications for Renaissance Food Group. We are a fresh cut fruit and vegetable processor based in Rancho Cordova, California. Um, I'm also a proud member of the United Fresh Produce Association. Uh, United Fresh represents all segments of the fruit and vegetable industry across the country. And United Fresh is part of the Specialty Crop Farm Bill Alliance. And I'd like to highlight a few of the Alliance top farm bill policy priorities. The first one is invasive pests and diseases, specialty crops in industry continues to support actions by federal government to eradicate and protect domestic market from increasing threat of exotic pests and diseases in entering the United States. We believe Congress should continue to support these important programs. Nutrition. A key nutrition program is the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Snack Program, which reached more than 4 million low-income children. <coughs> and we believe that this is a highly effective program in providing fresh fruit and vegetables to the youth of our nation and should be continued. Research. The 2008 and 2014 Farm Bill included key provisions which dedicated funding for the Specialty Crop Research Initiative and Specialty Crop Grant programs. These investments must be sustained in the 2018 Farm Bill. Trade. Uh, U.S. specialty crop growers um, face significant obstacles due to the perishability of our products. We strongly support the continuation of te technical assistance to specialty crops and market marketing access promotion programs. And finally, ag workforce. I know immigration policy is not under this committee's jurisdiction, but our industry needs lead leaders in agriculture policy at the forefront, pressing Congress to take action on immigration policy that addresses our critical labor needs. Without them, our industry will suffer greatly. So I and other members of United Fresh Produce Association look forward to working with you um, and, then, and on this and other issues and, and in the fruit and vegetable industry. Thank you. Thank you, Nelia. 
Lupe uh, Lopez, and then uh, Joseph Augusto. Good morning. My name is Lupe Lopez, and I'm the owner of uh, six grocery stores in the Bay Area. Um, through the grocery store, I see firsthand the struggles that people that have very little money to spend on food go through. So I urge you to <coughs> support the SNAP program and to expand on it, uh, specifically the incentive programs. Through struggling, um, through, my, through seeing my customers struggle, I see when they come in and they have very little money to spend and they reach for the first thing, which is either pastas that are inexpensive or the hot dogs. Why? Because they can get two meals out of this hot dog for a family of four. So what happens with this? Obesity and unhealthy. Through the incentive programs, we can gain a lot more. Since February of this year, I've been part of an incentive program called Double Food Backs. And how does it work? You come to the store and you buy California grown produce and as you purchase those produce, then you qualify for extra fund. For instance, I come to the store and I buy tomatoes, I buy lettuce, and now I, I was able to buy the melon. I spent $5.23. So with this $5.23, then we issue a coupon for the same value, penny for penny up to $10. So that customer is now able to come back, purchase the peaches, purchase the corn, the chiles, and also the blueberries. So what do you gain with that? You gain a customer that is putting food on the table, which makes a big difference for the family. You gain a healthier, individual, what do we gain? We gain not spending as much money on, on their medical bill. What is the farming gains? The farmer, suddenly more produce that are being grown in California are being bought. So the California economy is growing. So it's a win-win situation. So let's expand those incentive programs. Let's support the, the, the SNAP program. Don't cut this vital program because it's the difference of the children having food on the table or being hungry all day. Thank you. Thank you, Lupe. Next, we'll have Joseph Augusto and then Luke O'Leary. Good morning, gentlemen. Chairman Conway and members of the committee, my name is Joe Augusto. I currently serve as president of the California Dairy Campaign, CDC. CDC is a grassroots organization representing dairy family farmers throughout California. CDC is a member organization of the California Farmers Union, CFU, a state chapter of the National Farmers Union, a farm organization representing more than 200,000 farmers and ranchers nationwide. California is the largest milk producing state, but continues to face significant challenges due to different prices, between, uh, difference between prices paid to dairy producers and the cost of producing milk in their state. During this Farm Bill debate, our members consider it critical that Congress recognize the failure of the Dairy Margin Protection Program to provide an effective safety net, particularly for dairy farmers in California. Dairy farmers lack a real confidence in this program because they paid substantial premiums in the Margin Protection Program in the first full year and it failed to provide any sort of effective safety net. The margins in the Dairy Margin Protection Program fail to reflect the farm margins for dairy producers in California. When the, when the Dairy Margin Protection Program was originally proposed, dairy farmers in California were told that it would be better than the Milk Income Loss Program because more milk would be eligible for coverage. Our organization opposed the Dairy Margin Protection Program during the last Farm Bill debate because we considered it to be an untested insurance scheme. Today, the test results are in and they're not good for California. Just one dairy farmer signed up for coverage level above the $4 uh, catastrophic level in 2017. The debate in Congress now seems to be focused on lowering premium for uh, producer operations below 5 million pounds of production per year, or approximately 233 cows. 
is important to recognize that the average herd size in California, according to latest CDF, DA, uh, CDFA statistics, total now uh, 1,249 cows for California. Under their proposed changes passed by the Senate Agriculture Appropriations Committee, which has received some support from members of both House and Senate Ag Committees, the premium rates for any production above 5 million pounds or operations above two, uh, 233 cows would be approximately 10 times higher. Not only would this create an equitable system for larger operations in California, it would also insulate smaller dairies from any market signals and would increase milk supplies in the future regardless of market conditions, depressing milk prices further. I would like to today dispel the myth that larger dairy operations are not in need of a safety net because they have other risk management tools. Uh, when milk prices do not match milk costs, there is no way out. I need or to wrap dairies. up. Yeah, you need to wrap it up. Uh, okay, they need, okay. They need to um, encompass a uh, federal, federal dairy program that should be safety net encompass all dairy sizes. With that, I, so I'm out of time. I'd like to just say on behalf of the California Dairy Campaign, uh, I, think, uh, I thank the committee for letting me testify here today, and I would like to request the ability to submit additional written testimony on a range of subjects important to the dairy producer to the committee. Thank you again. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Again, it's, I know it's a short time, but make sure you get your comments in, and we'll have that up at the end so that you can make sure and get the written comments. But we have a stack here. We want to make sure and give everybody some time. So Luke, O'Leary, and then after that, O'Leary Han. Han. Good morning, my name is Luke O'Leary, State President of the California FFA Association. Uh, I'm here to uh, just extend on behalf of the California FFA Association, as well as truly the national FFA organization, um, a reminder that agriculture industry as well as agricultural education are inherently tied. And as we consider the farm bill and consider the future of our industry, um, we must constantly consider those students who are beginning to join college and careers uh, in the agricultural industry. Our association and our organization uh, impacts students' lives positively um, by developing their potential for premier leadership and personal, success, uh, personal growth, as well as career success. And we do this so that we can grow leaders who will then build communities and strengthen the agricultural industry. Uh, our organization across the nation has grown tremendously over the years, now reaching 650,000 students across the country. And just in the past year, our association has grown nearly 4,000 students. It's now having a total of 87,000 members in the state of California. Uh, we're hopeful about the future of agricultural education um, because of the response we've seen for students as they've experienced rigorous classroom instruction as well as hands-on relevant uh, projects as they put what they learned in the classroom into practice in their, in their supervised agricultural experience projects and then get, a, uh, get tangible relationships uh, with other students from across the country through the FFA and the leadership development they experienced there. Um, we're grateful for the relationship and cooperation we have uh, with legislators in our own state as well as across the nation so that we can continue uh, to promote agricultural education in our industry. Um, sp some specific bills that have come up recently in our state of securing more funding for agricultural education as well as nationwide, as well as certain bills that um, in, in our capital right now that are handling with tax exemptions for students' projects for the first $5,000 they earn annually are very important bills to uh, consider, perhaps including in pieces of the Farm Bill that will support the future of these students who are pursuing careers in the agricultural industry. So we thank you for your time and we thank you for the constant consideration uh, of the hopefulness of our students who are the future of our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Very good. Illyria and then Martin Sedevindami, I believe. Martin, but Illyria. I'm Olivia Hahn. Olivia. I'm sorry. I live in San Jose, California, and I'm a district leader volunteer with the Humane Society of the United States. As we all know, animal welfare is a growing concern for many Americans, including myself. Uh, we've witnessed this growing concern in corporate reform and animal agriculture, as well as local, state, and federal legislation. I ask that the committee not try to weaken, delay, or block the organic livestock and poultry practices final rule. The USDA published a final rule to strengthen and clarify the animal welfare standards to protect the integrity of the organic label. 
uh, following a memorandum to freeze all regulatory actions, the USDA opened a comment period soliciting input on whether the rule should be allowed to become effective. Nearly 50,000 comments poured in, with more than 99% favoring the immediate implementation of this rule as it was finalized. Every measure of public sentiment has favored the adoption of this rule, which was decades in the making. The rule would keep thousands of farmers on the farm and give them a value-added opportunity to connect to consumers who are willing to pay more for organic products, but expect them to be consistent with higher animal welfare standards. I ask you please keep the integrity of this rule as you put together the Farm Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, so we'll have Mark next and then Sean Hurley. Thank you, Chairman Conway, members of the committee. My name is Martin Sutter Demi, and I serve as the president of the California Agricultural Commissioners and Sealers Association, or CACASA. California Agricultural Commissioners are the boots on the ground implementing many of the federal programs Congress authorizes. And I can tell you firsthand, both the funding and the consistency of funding by Congress is critical as the work we do is biological in nature. First, the authorization of Section 10.007 in the 2014 Farm Bill helps with consistently funding ongoing initiatives that support the United States comprehensive network of local, state, and federal stakeholders addressing pests and diseases harmful to the ag industry. The current level of $75 million should be maintained in the upcoming 2018 Farm Bill. Also, the use of these funds should strictly adhere to the targeted activities previously authorized by Congress. Secondly, APHIS collects an estimated $754 million in user fees. We believe a portion of those dollars should be authorized to augment stakeholder activities throughout the comprehensive network of local, state, and federal efforts to combat pests and diseases harmful to the ag industry. And lastly, in the forest, forestry title, we urge your consideration of the U.S. Forest Service's fire borrowing and its impact on biological programs directed at improving forest health and reducing hazardous fuels. We also urge consideration of reducing regulatory hurdles of NEPA analysis for invasive species management. We understand that you have a tremendous task before you in crafting and passing the 2018 Farm Bill. CACASA supports the committee's efforts in maintaining a broad coalition of organizations interested in other important programs, such as commodities, conservation, and nutrition. Thank you for your time, and we appreciate you coming to California. Thank you, Martin. Sean Hurley, and after that, John Pandel. My name is Sean Hurley, and I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of California Polytechnic State University Colleges of Agriculture, Food, Environmental Science, and our Dean, Andy Thulin. The college is globally recognized as a center of excellence in applied sciences. It enrolls 4,000 undergraduate students, making it the fifth largest undergraduate and the largest non-land-grant college of agriculture. The university's farmland is situated where much of the leafy greens and berries are grown for the nation. The university utilizes over 10,000 acres of agricultural land for production, research, and processing facility to educate our students in one of 15 majors. As the House Committee on Agriculture begins to draft a new farm bill, I ask that you please reinvest in non-land grant colleges and agriculture, of agriculture and Hispanic serving agricultural college and universities, and also to reauthorize the McIntyre Stennis Capacity Grants, Hispanic serving ed institution educational grants, specialty crop research initiative, specialty crop block grants program, and the agricultural college and infrastructure improvement programs. I ask that you please amend existing eligibility to allow campuses to apply for both the McIntyre Stennis Capacity Grants Program for forestry research and the non-land grant colleges of agricultural program which offers capacity building for non-land grant schools. Those that receive funding from McIntyre Stennis are ineligible to compete for this other grant and vice versa. Non-land grants have separate and necessary capacity building needs in both agriculture and forestry. Under existing law, they are forced to choose one funding source over the other. The law needs to be amended to allow campuses to compete for both. The Specialty Crop Research Initiative provides grants to support research and extension for the specialty crop industry. California researchers received over $30 million from this program from 2008 to 2014. The Specialty Crops Block Grant Program provides grants 
for states to run competitive grants program for research, marketing, and education about specialty crops. As you know, California produces a large percentage of the specialty crops in the U.S., including 73% of the total domestic non-citrus fruit and 70% of the total vegetables in the U.S. These funding sources are extremely important for maintaining the technical capacity to produce these high-value nutritious crops. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Sean. Next, we'll have John Pandel, and after John, Lester Patrick. Uh, John Pandel, I'm based in Delano, California. We bank about half of our money growing grapes in Central California. The other half of the money, we uh, turn crops into cash for other growers in California, New Jersey, Georgia, Mexico, Peru, and Chile. Two quick things and a, and a big thing. One, country of origin labeling. Get rid of it. We argued about it for 10 years. We've had it for 10 years. We got nothing to show for it. You want to eliminate a few things, like our president said, let's get rid of that one. Second, some of the little regional promotional programs, like we have the Buy California, Jersey Fresh. I spend 75 days a year talking to retailers and wholesalers. I've had very little call for those types of deal. They've done their benefit. The states want to do them or industry want to do them, fine, but the federal government doesn't need to fund that. The big thing is foreign trade. It is absolutely critical that the U.S. be viewed as a reliable market and supplier. Uh, we get, uh, you know, it looks like TTP is in, the, um, is in the rest area for right now, but it is absolutely critical that we maintain and respect all of our other trade deals, especially NAFTA, which is such a big deal. Um, right now there's rumblings on a lot of little sectors, that guys that want to go out and put dumping Dumping cases have no place in the produce business. It should be prohibited. Uh, I've, had, I've been involved in five dumping cases, both as an exporter and importer. They're like divorces. They're messy, expensive, and nobody wins. So dumping must be taken off the table as a remedy in the, in the produce business. And since I got a little time, I want to thank you guys for serving in Congress. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't put up with the incivility and the indignities that you guys got to deal with with constituents, and I, you know, my respects. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, next, we'll have Lester Patrick, and after that, Dulce Garcia. Okay. Good morning. My name is Lester Patrick. I'm from Stockton, and I'm currently a commissioner of the uh, Housing Authority of San Joaquin County, uh, which services low-income uh, people throughout San Joaquin County uh, with public housing, uh, housing choice vouchers, and other related uh, services. And I want to focus your attention just briefly on those people this morning and how cuts in the farm bill will impact them. Currently, there's about 303,000 California household receiving uh, housing choice vouchers. And about 30,000 low-income people in California uh, live in public housing and have an income, believe it or not, of less than $20,000 a year. Most of these households include children, the elderly, as well as the disabled, and are also SNAP recipients. Seventy-three percent of low-income people pay more than half of their income towards rent, with very little left for food. Um, so if there's support for SNAP is, is uh, cut, then obviously this reduces the amount of money that these people then have for food, especially with the, uh, uh, the rate of increase in rent uh, throughout California. For 11 years, I have conducted a mentoring program uh, at three schools. And in doing so, I try to take students on field trips. One of the primary uh, decisions that have to be made in planning a field trip is when to leave and when to get back so that the students can have food. Students should not have to make those kinds of decisions because some of them are required to then decide, do I go on a field trip or do I stay at school where I can get food? No student in the United States should be faced with making that kind of decision. However, the recipients, the children of recipients of uh, uh, public housing do sometimes have to make those decisions. I respectfully urge you this morning not to cut any uh, SNAP or any other program that, uh, 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 that fights hunger 
and uh, food insecurity in the United States. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lester. Next, we'll hear from Dulce Garcia and then Lisa Kessler. Good morning, Chairman Conaway and members of the House Agriculture Committee. My name is Dulce Garcia. I am the Secretary and former Communications Officer of Region 5 for the Student Senate for California Community Colleges, and I reside in the Central Valley, the heart of California, Madera, where agriculture and supply of food is important in my town and nearby colleges. The Student Center for California Community Colleges is a nonprofit organization advocating for student rights at the local, regional, and state level. We do go to the Capitol and we do support bills up there, which represents 2.1 plus, 2 plus million community college students in California. I come to voice my student perspective on the importance of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, contained in the Farm Bill. This past semester in the spring, vo while volunteering for the Ram Pantry at Fresno City College, a food pantry available for students who are in dire need need of food and other supplements. I learned and talked to a few students who made it known that food insecurity is there and is an issue, not just on campuses, but at home as well. 22% of community college students said they, they'd gone hungry due to lack of money and food, which leads to health issues and lack of academics. A student's daily struggle is to be stable and have ho housing, but an even greater struggle is to meet the basic need of food supplement. Food insecurity is one of the most devastating variables to the de development of the future of America. SNAP supports nutrition assistance for low-income individuals, such as students and families. It's the largest program in the domestic hunger safety net. We hope you keep this in mind and recognize we students are involved and ready to tackle this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee and share my views on this very important topic. Thank you, Jelsey. Uh, Lisa Kessler and then Joel Carlin. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lisa Kessler, the interim dean of the Huntley College of Agriculture at Cal Poly Pomona. Our college offers comprehensive bachelor's and master's degrees in programs in agriculture and is the only such program in the southern half of this large state. We have more than 2,000 students in the following departments, human nutrition and food science, animal and veterinary science, ag business, ag science, plant science, apparel merchandising and management. 80% of our majors are students of color, and 76% are females, and many are from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, and are first in their family to attend college. Our students engage in hands-on learning on a 700-acre farm that includes swine, cattle, sheep, vineyards, greenhouses, crops, and the W.K. Kellogg Arabian Horse Center, which is the oldest continually operating Arabian horse breeding farm in the country. There are two aspects of this legislation that are particularly important to us. Cal Poly Pomona is a Hispanic-serving institution, an HSI. Programs that support minority-serving institutions are especially critical in agriculture. The HSIs, along with our sister minority-serving institutions, fill in the geographical and service gaps left behind by the land-grant institutions. HSI grants have provided extensive internship opportunities for our students which are critical to their preparation for the ag workforce, including work with the USDA. Please continue these HSI internships when at whatever you can to assure their robust support. Secondly, the programs of our college place emphasis upon how we serve our urban and suburban environment. Applied research efforts, such as the Specialty Crops Initiative, are vital to what we're able to accomplish in urban agriculture. Please retain support for applied research that allows us to address and resolve the complex problems facing our agricultural industry. Thank you for supporting ag education at the university level. Thank you, Lisa. We'll have next uh, Joel Carlin and then uh, Gary Martin. Good morning. My name is uh, Joel Carlin. I'm an economist at Western Milling, which is one of the largest feed manufacturers of uh, feed in the country. Uh, uh, we service and sell feed to the more than 1.75 million uh, cows and 1,400 dairy operations in the state of uh, California. In addition to my uh, uh, research uh, uh, responsibilities at Western Milling, I also uh, teach uh, uh, agriculture and food policy and international ag econ at Fresno State's uh, Department of Ag Business. Topic I wish to address is uh, the importance of foreign trade. Many people in the audience are aware the economics of dairying has deteriorated over the past number of years, both nationwide, particularly in the state of California, which despite a number of impediments, remains the dairy, dairy, largest dairy producing state 
in the country. The escalation of feed prices and the long-term decline of milk prices has uh, made uh, margins uh, either non-existent or unprofitable for many producers. For California dairy uh, men and women, they're already beset uh, with the unenviable combination of the highest feed costs and lowest milk prices. Problems are magnified by a number of factors inherent in the state, including increased regulations with regard to air, water, and land, uh, forthcoming minimum wage and overtime work stipulations, drought, and the increased difficulty in procuring farm workers due to uh, immigration concerns. In the past 10 years, California, uh, which used to produce 23% of the nation's milk, is down to 18%. Our cow numbers have fallen 100,000, while uh, those in the United States uh, have increased. Um, I think the, uh, the biggest factor is that uh, foreign trade is uh, very important. The fact is that people throughout the world need United States products. Uh, it results in a wider variety of goods and uh, lower prices. Uh, California, which produces a uh, large amount of milk, a tremendous amount is exported. Unfortunately, a large amount is turned into powder, which is exactly the product that's needed uh, overseas. Uh, I would urge the committee to uh, pay particular attention to trade, particularly uh, for the country. U.S. ag is the only sector of the U.S. economy that enjoys a trade surplus. We export more than we import. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Gary Martin will be next. And we passed over, I didn't see, is it Janet or Janae DaCosta from Driscoll's? Are they in the room? Okay, then after Gary, we'll go with uh, Janet Smith. Chairman Conaway, gentlemen. My name is Gary Martin. Uh, primarily been farming in Fresno County for over 80 years. We currently farm Pima Cotton, Minimum Till. Just get closer. We okay with that? Yep, there you go. Sorry about that. We're also growing almonds, drip, micro sprinklers, alfalfa supported by solar power for our ag wells, and lift pumps. For the last three years, market returns from cotton and cottonseed have fallen short of the total cost of production. These costs do not include return to management and family living expenses. When accounting for the minimal federal farm policy support provided for cotton, the last three years have seen total costs significantly exceed our returns. These sustained losses in the current period are unlike any in recent U.S. history for cotton. It is my hope that the administration can operate, step forward, and offer farmers like myself a bridge to the next farm bill with the cotton gin cost share program. The last administration operated the program is extremely helpful to California growers like myself. It is imperative that comprehensive cotton support that is on par with other commodities be included in Title I of the next Farm Bill. Conservation programs continue to be extremely popular across the cotton belt, specifically in California, the EQIP program is critically important in providing us with cost share funding to implement practices to help comply with the litany of regulations we face on our farms. I commend the committee for streamlining conservation programs in the 2014 Farm Bill. This has made it easier for NRCS to administer, more importantly, easier for producers like myself to utilize. These programs have become integral parts of many producers' operations and achieve the goal of protecting and improving the environment while also enhancing production on our operation. As commodity prices have fallen, these cost share programs have become even more important as a way for many producers to help cash flow their operations. I encourage you to continue the robust funding for our working lands cost share programs. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Gary. Janet Smith and then Rudolph Villegas. In 1983, when I got my first part-time job in high school, I worked with a couple of young Navy wives. I remembered, I remembered that one of the women, a mother of two young daughters, had food stamps. I don't know if she utilized the now eliminated FSSA program or if she was on the program now called SNAP. What I do remember was that despite military housing, subsidized childcare, and having two full-time working parents, their family qualified for food assistance due to the high cost of living in the Silicon Valley. Representative Denham, I know that you were once in enlisted in the Air Force. 
I am certain that you serve with families in similar situations. In 2014, the USDA projected 22,000 military families were using SNAP to help support their families. 8% of veterans' families are utilizing the SNAP program. In 2014, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities reported that nearly 100,000 veterans in California alone depended on the SNAP program to feed their families. In addition, more than one quarter of recent veterans reported service-connected disabilities, which can make it harder to provide for their families. Households with a veteran who has a disability that prevents him or her from working are about twice as likely to lack access to adequate food as households that do not include some, compared to households that do not include someone with a disability. For veterans struggling to overcome obstacles to feed their families, SNAP makes a crucial difference. I am asking all of you to commit to maintaining SNAP funding and refuse to sever the SNAP program from the 2018 Farm Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. It looks like we're going to be able to get all the cards that we have as long as everybody sticks there two minutes, and I appreciate that, Janet. You were under, and so we're going to have Rudolph, and after that, Kimberly Holding. Good morning, Chairman Conway and members of the Agriculture House Committee. Um, my name is Rudolph Villegas, and I am an executive officer for the Student Senate for California Community Colleges, a nonprofit organization which represents 2.1 million community college students in our state of California. I come to voice a student perspective on the importance of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, contained in the Farm Bill. In a student's daily struggle, one primary consideration is securing stable housing, but even greater to that is the encumbrance to meet the basic necessity of food. Food insecurity is one of the most crippling instabilities to the development of the future workforce of America. SNAP supports low-income Californians, including students, seniors, disabled children in, cer in special circumstances, out-of-work persons, and the general citizenry of this great country. I offer a personal experience to show by comparison the disparity experienced by others which are less fortunate than myself. At reaching the age of 18, I was immediately expelled to the world from my home. With no support but a bit of savvy, thankfully I leaned on the California Community College system to pursue my education and acquire a student worker job serving the public. I slept in the cold parts of San Diego, battling the weather and struggling to survive. At no point did I actually qualify for SNAP, however. Uh, the experience opened my eyes to the real struggles and, and daily realities of others which are of low income, which must have had it way worse than I did. In our particular demographic, I wish to stress the urgency of continued support for programs which assist us in meeting our basic needs. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee and share my perspective on this important topic and for your consideration when you review this in the Farm Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudolph. Kimberly Holding. Okay, then we're going to go Leonard Van Eldren. There we go. And after Leonard, Don Ward. Good morning. My name is Leonard Van Elder, and I'm uh, president and CEO of Yosemite Farm Credit, part of the Farm Credit system. Last week we were uh, on Capitol Hill, and I think it was a little cooler there than it is here today. <laughs> um, we've got $2.5 billion primarily in two counties, the county where you sit today and the county to the south of us, Stanislaw and Merced County. 35% of that loan volume is dairy volume. And uh, our dairymen are struggling, and we just ask that you would address the uh, dairy support in the Farm Bill. We also look at uh, crop insurance. And while we might like to have very cheap corn and very cheap grains for the dairy business, we realize that um, grain farmers need to survive also and need to have a viable operation. And so uh, we just ask that you would take a look at crop insurance for what it does for the state of California but also especially where uh, food products come from for, uh, for the cows that we feed here. We'd ask that you would take a look at FSA guarantee levels, uh, 1.399 million on the guarantee program and 300,000 on the direct program. About a mile from here, we're financing property that's costing about 30 to $40,000 an acre. And as you can see, uh, in order to get young, beginning and small farmers off the ground, those guarantees do not go very far or allow us to do much there. And finally, uh, rural infrastructure. Farm Credit has been a, a, a proponent for rural infrastructure and bringing people together to support that, and we would ask for your support in that area also. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Don Ward will be up next, and then Nicole Van Vleck. Good morning, um, Chairman and Committee. My name is Don Ward, and I'm here with as a Deputy District Volunteer 
uh, Deputy District Volunteer with the Humane Society of United States. And I'm coming here today to urge you to keep animal welfare in mind when putting together the Farm Bill. The Prevent All Scoring Tactics Act, or H.R. 1847, is a bill that would ban devices integral to the cruelty of horse soaring, strengthen penalties, and end the failed system of industry self-policing and hold abusers accountable. The bill, is cur the bill currently has 252 House co-sponsors, including about 80 Republicans with a half dozen Republican co-sponsors on the House Agricultural Committee, also including Vice Chairman Glenn Thompson and the lead author veterinarian Ted Yoho. The USDA is an agency responsible for enforcing Horse Protection Act that the PAST Act, or H.R. 1847, amends. So the Farm Bill is a logical place to consider an upgrade to the law. My special thanks go to Representative, Representative Denham, since he is a co-sponsor of the PAST Act. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Don. We'll have Nicole Van Vleck, and after that, Kimberly Holden. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nicole Van Vleck, and I'm a farmer in Sutter County, about 45 minutes south of Mr. LaMalfa. I farm with my sister and my parents. Um, I'm representing the California Rice Commission's Producers Committee. We represent 25 rice farmers in California, and I'm the chair of that committee, and I'm also the vice chair of USA Rice Farmers. I want to um, mentioned today that the situation in California, as many of you know, for rice has been significantly challenged in the last few years. In all honesty, when the Farm Bill was signed in 2014, we did not expect a payment to be triggered during the life of the Farm Bill for rice in California. However, as a result of market declines and fluctuation in our um, acreage over the last few years due to drought first and then flooding last year, we have had significant issues uh, with our market and a steep decline. With that, both the ARC and the PLC will trigger for rice farmers for 2016 and very possibly for 2017. We have safety net needs, um, two of which are critical. For PLC, the reference price for rice produced in California is far below the cost of production and not equivalent to the level of protection provided for in our other rice growing regions throughout the United States. We ask that a modification be made. And please note this su is supported by USA Rice as well as through an economic analysis provided for by Texas A&M. Rice is also widely recognized for the critical waterfowl and shorebird habitat provided for on our working lands. We have forged many important partnerships with bird conservation groups, including Ducks Unlimited, of which I'm a life member. Their efforts to work with rice growers nationally help deliver farm bill conservation programs to working lands. To support these working farms, we need to tweak conservation programs to better meet wildlife needs, specifically the, we need a longer equip contract period that is specific for annual wildlife friendly farming practices. The wildlife would benefit from such a tweak. It, we, if we could designate 5% of the available equip funds for enhancement of long term health of our American flyways, rice can help benefit those American flyways. Um, I want to thank you for trying to get the Farm Bill done in a timely fashion. And whether we grow vegetables or rice or dairy, we really need a Farm Bill here in California that works for the diversity of all of California. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. <coughs> Kimberly Holding and then Rob Vanden Heuvel. Chairman Conway and members of the House Agriculture Committee, my name is Kimberly Holding. I'm the President and CEO of the American Olive Oil Producers Association. I'd like to take a moment to address two market-related challenges before I address the Farm Bill, which are the EU's $3 billion per year subsidies of their olive oil industry, which creates excess supply and exports of olive oil to the U.S., and fraudulent olive oil, which creates marketplace instability. IOPA greatly appreciates the spotlight that many members of this committee have placed on these issues, and we look forward to working with you to address them. Our members across the U.S. utilize a number of the Farm Bill programs, including conservation, the market access program, and rural development. We encourage you to continue authorizing funding for these programs, as well as the specialty crop grant programs, 
that are vital to the growth of our nascent industry. The SCBG program has provided well over $1.2 million for research, education, and marketing efforts to develop our industry in California, Georgia, Texas, and Florida. The SCRI program awarded a $50,000 planning grant to AUPA last year to develop a strategic plan to identify and prioritize our research needs throughout the U.S. This brought together industry leaders and land-grant universities from California, Georgia, Texas, and Florida to work together for the first time. And we're currently working to develop a full SCRI grant that will be a multi-year, multi-institution, multi-million dollar grant. Lastly, I'd like to address crop insurance. It's an important safety net. Our California olive oil producers are eligible for crop insurance, and we encourage the committee to maintain the program's authorization as it currently stands. And we also encourage the committee to amend the adjusted gross income limitations to $2 million, which will expand eligibility for high-value specialty crop farmers, such as our olive oil producers. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Next, Rob Vandenhuvel and then Jim Parsons. Rob Vandenhuvel, uh, representing California Dairies Incorporated, a uh, farmer-owned cooperative uh, made up of 400 California dairy families. Um, in the 2014 Farm Bill, when the Margin Protection Program was created, it was uh, sold to the industry as a move away from picking winners and losers in the industry based solely on farm size into a scenario where we're having a safety net for all farmers, regardless of size. Um, certainly there are things we can look at in the Margin Protection Program for improvements uh, and tweaks, uh, but a troubling uh, news, as, as we talked about uh, earlier with one of the previous witnesses coming out of the Senate Appropriations Committee, looking at some tweaks focused solely on the, uh, the smaller farmer side of our industry. Um, we got to resist that temptation, certainly with the budget constraints that you all face with the Farm Bill uh, and, and generally the budget with the Appropriations Committee. Um, the, the temptation is to take care of the smaller farms because it's a lot more affordable. We've got to look at, at policies that apply to everybody. Bu budget constraints doesn't excuse bad policy, and, uh, and we need a safety net that applies to all farmers who are, are facing these uh, booms and busts and the volatility of our milk prices and feed commodities. Um, so I wanted to make that point uh, on improvements to the program. Um, California Dairies is very much in line with uh, some of the other um, cooperatives around the country, National Milk Producers Federation, on, uh, on some of the restoration of cuts that were made in the last Farm Bill uh, to the program, uh, but really just want to make the point uh, short term, we need to resist those temptations to take care of just the small guys. So thank you very much, and uh, Congressman Evans, Chairman Conway, I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in California. Thank you, Rob. Up next will be Jim Parsons, and I believe it's Jane Subi, and CCOF will be after Jim. Good morning, committee, Chairman Conway, members of Congress. I'm Jim Parsons. I farm in Congressman Valadeo's district, I'll, and I live in his district. I also farm in uh, Congressman McCarthy's district. I farm dry land wheat, irrigated wheat, organic wheat, corn silage, alfalfa, lettuce for seed, and we're trying cotton this year for the first time. I have used the Farm Bill in the past. The uh, crop insurance program I use for the wheat and the oranges. I'd like to see it continued. I ho would not like to see the AGI reduced. I I do farm with uh, my nephews, so there's more than one in the operation. Um, I'd like to see the FMD and the MAP program continued because the bulk of my operation is wheat, and we do happen to have an oversupply of wheat right now. Research, I would like to see that continued. Um, ARS lab, when I visited it a couple years ago, was working on a program to get gluten out of wheat. I don't know how successful they've been, but they have been doing it. Also, some years back, we had a rust problem in California, and I planted 
a variety that was supposedly rust resistant, and it was. But eventually, they came out with 515, which is um, some genes that are resistant to rust. So I sold my entire crop and purchased the 515 and went that way. Uh, I would like to thank the committee for letting me speak to them today. Thank you, Jim. We'll have Jane, Jane Subi and then uh, Colleen Rebecca. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Chairman Conaway, for convening a Farm Bill hearing session here in California, the mightiest agricultural state in the nation. Um, and thank you, Congressman Denham, for hosting this meeting. I'm Jane Subi. I'm the Senior Policy Specialist for California Certified Organic Farmers. CCOF is a nonprofit organization that ad advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through organic certification, education, and advocacy. We represent 3,500 certified organic operations across the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. And here in California, we certify 2,000 organic farms and ranches. Organic production offers a remarkable opportunity for farmers and ranchers. It has reached $6 billion in farm gate value in the United States in 2015. California's organic farms and ranches produce 40% of the total, producing $2.4 billion of organic farm gate value. Together with the value of California's organic processed products, gross value of certified organic sales in California was $12.34 billion in 2016. Using a multiplier, we calculate that this has created 259,000 jobs in the state. To support existing organic farmers and ranchers and to create conditions that will attract new producers to organic, the organic infrastructure must be strong. We have submitted written feedback to the committee on our farm bill priorities and will today emphasize our top three. First, keep the national organic program strong. The national organic program is responsible for overseeing and enforcing organic standards in 50 states and overseeing the international organic supply chain. It's a big job and they need adequate resources to do it. Second, bring dedicated organic research funds to baseline levels. We hope and request that the entire California congressional delegation that sits on this committee will recognize the importance of research and sign on as co-sponsors of the Organic Agriculture Research Act, which will provide much needed stability to the to um, organic research and extension initiative. Third, please maintain the organic certification cost share program. Uh, it's important in making uh, certification accessible to growers of all scales. We'll need to wrap up because we've got, we're gonna try to get through everybody. So if you could put your comments in by written. Thank you very much for your, this opportunity. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, we're gonna really keep the time close because we wanna get everybody in. So we have Colleen, Rebecca, and then Alan Moore. Hello, Chairman Conway and members of the Ag Committee. I'm Colleen Rebecca. Um, I work at St. Anthony's in San Francisco. Um, we are a special place that's located in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, one of the poorest neighborhoods of the city. Um, we've been around 67 years, and our flagship program is a free meal program. We serve an average of 2,400 meals a day. That's um, almost 900,000 meals a year to low-income, homeless, San Franciscans, working poor folks, people who are housed but still have a lot of trouble making ends meet, veterans, um, seniors, and people with disabilities. Um, we think of ourselves as the hands below the government-funded safety net. We, we run our programs without government support. Um, but we run our programs in partnership um, with, with programs like SNAP and other programs in our community um, that help to serve the folks that we take care of every day. Our mission is to help people with basic needs um, that they have today, but also work towards a time when we can be out of business because we don't have people who are struggling to feed themselves in our community anymore. Um, it's in that spirit that I'm here today. Um, I want to talk about the importance of the SNAP program to the people that eat in our dining room. About 35% of the folks that eat in our dining room receive SNAP as well. Um, with 
without the stamp program, we would see business booming at St. Anthony's even more than it, than it currently is. Um, it's an important um, support for folks that are struggling to make ends meet and are struggling to make their lives better. Um, and there's also a, a um, part of the SNAP program that our county has opted into called Restaurant Meals, which allows homeless people and people without access to kitchens to be able to um, use their SNAP benefits to get prepared food so that they can, um, that they can be able to, you know, increase their stability with SNAP as well. Restaurant Meals is really important and helps SNAP work for people, even people that don't have kitchens at home. And if you have any questions about it, I'd love to talk more or submit my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Colleen. We'll have Alan Moy and then David Absher. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Moy. I'm the executive director of the Pacific Coast Farmers Market Association. We are a nonprofit organization that operates more than 50 farmers markets in the San Francisco Bay Area. Our farmers markets provide economic opportunities for more than 260 California farmers. These are small scale specialty crop farms, nearly all of them family owned and operated. I strongly encourage you to keep the unique needs of these farms in mind as you craft the next farm bill. To be successful, these farms need three things. Assistance to grow and harvest their crops on their farms, healthy markets in which they can sell those crops, and customers with the means to purchase their crops. The 2014 Farm Bill made great advances in each of these three areas. In California, under the very able management of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program has produced important research to assist small-scale farms with production, harvesting, and post-harvest handling. Markets for specialty crops are strengthened by the investment of USDA's Farmers Market Promotion Program and Local Food Promotion Program. And more customers are able to buy specialty crops from these farmers through investments in SNAP, the Farmers Market Nutrition Program, and the Food Insecurity and Nutrition Incentive Program, which Lupe spoke about, which also supports California's Market Match Program, of which we are a founding member. <coughs> Excuse me. A disinvestment in any one of these three areas threatens the viability of the small-scale specialty crop farmers that we serve, and thousands more like them. If we do not continue to support these programs that strengthen the small-scale farmer, we are also closing off the path to the new farmers that will follow. Hewlett Packard started in a garage and Facebook in a dorm room. They started small and grew as they became successful. New farmers must have the same opportunity to start small, work hard, and grow their businesses. Without ongoing support for programs like the Specialty Crop Block Grants, Farmers Market Nutrition Program, and Food and Security Nutrition Incentive Program, that, that path to starting and growing a farm will be much more difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Absher and then Ben Feldman. Good morning, my name is Dave Absher. Uh, we are involved in, uh, can you hear, I guess it's picking me up even though it's a little uh, low. Uh, again, my name is Dave Absher. I'm here on behalf of the California Cattlemen's Association. Uh, we, as a family, are involved in uh, California agriculture in five counties, stretching from Mariposa County to Modoc County. California beef production plays a prominent role in California's agriculture, and with 3.5 billion in cash receipts produced annually, Ranching is a California's fourth largest agricultural commodity. Farm Bill programs play an important role in helping ranchers withstand natural disasters like drought and improve the production efficiencies of our operations. Improving the regulatory climate in Washington, D.C. is also extremely important. Although many regulatory programs are not the product of the Farm Bill, the Farm Bill can and should be used to ease regulation on ranchers. We know well that the government intrusion in the marketplace disrupts the speed of commerce and even regulations that are well intended can actually harm, not help, our state's farmers and ranchers. In general, the principles we'd like to express here are federal farm policy should not guarantee profit, restrict the operation of the competitive marketplace, dictate who can or cannot own cattle, be used as a vehicle to enact new regulations on the cattle industry that are cost prohibitive. The Farm Bill should be used to promote U.S. agriculture both domestically and abroad. In, re in regard to fair trade and the GIPSA rule, the finalization of this rule will further disrupt commerce and create a trial attorney's dream by allowing any individual who believes they have been economically harmed due to bad trading practices to bring suit against a buyer with little or no evidence. In regard to Brazilian and Argentinian beef imports, California ranchers continue to oppose the importation of fresh and chilled beef from Brazil and Argentina. Ranchers promote and accept fair trade. However, this action by USDA leaves our nation's herds vulnerable to the outbreak of foot and mouth disease. In regard to trade, 
The export of U.S. beef plays an important role in returning the whole value of carcass to ranchers and producers across the beef production chain. In 2015, U.S. beef exports accounted for over $6 billion and $450 million in the export of California beef and beef products. Our, latest, our largest trading partners who purchase the greatest amount of U.S. beef are Japan, Canada, and Mexico. It's clear that TPP is dead. However, we encourage the administration to move forward with the development of trade agreements that promote the export of U.S. beef. We'll have to go with the rest on it, Dave. Okay. Thank Let's you for your opportunity. Thanks. Appreciate it, Dave. We're going to have Ben Feldman and then Kevin from Second Harvest, and I'm having trouble with your last name. So. Ben. Uh, thank you to the Ag Committee members for being here today. My name is Ben Feldman. Uh, I work at the National Farmers Market Coalition, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of our thousands of farmers market and farmer members. Uh, this was a significant one for farmers markets with the release of the Federal Reserve Report on Local Foods and Secretary Purdue signing of the proclamation for National Farmers Market Week, which begins Monday. Uh, the report, titled Harvesting Opportunity, highlights the significant role local food and farmers markets in particular play in developing new and beginning farmers, improving long-term farm viability, and generating economic growth in rural communities. The report also notes the need for increased education, partnerships, and research, as well as investment and development in the sector. And to that end, I'd like to speak to you today about three programs. The first is SNAP at Farmers Markets. Uh, ensuring a robust SNAP at all American farmers markets is critical for the health, nutrition, and choice of SNAP recipients and provides an important revenue, revenue source for farmers. Since 2014, the National Farmers Market Coalition has operated a low-cost wireless equipment program through a contract with FNS. In 2016 alone, this program supplied 892 wireless terminals to farmers and farmers markets. We would ask for support in resolving FNS's one location, one machine policy. This policy is both burdensome to markets and wasteful of taxpayer money. We appreciate the support that uh, Ag Committee members have provided to us on this issue already. We'd also ask for your support in maintaining efforts to increase SNAP redemption at farmers markets. Related to the SNAP program is the Food and Security Nutrition Incentive Program, which some uh, commenters have already spoken to today. In its first year, this program generated over $14 million in additional funds for American farmers, and 75% of the participants uh, report increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables as a result of the program. Please continue Finney funding at or above previous levels. Preserve the local and direct uh, to consumer priority that was included in the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, we'd encourage you also to consider reducing matching requirements for farmers markets, especially at the pilot level, and simplification of the evaluation component. Last but not least, the farmers market and local food promotion program has been an effective and important factor in the growth of farmers markets over the last 10 to 20 years. A 2013 study found that the modest investment as a result of the FMPP grants, customer attendance increased by 47% and vendor sales by 27%. Probably Please continue. Please continue funding for this program at or above previous levels. Thank you for taking yep, the time. I appreciate that. I know a lot of people have waited uh, to, to get their words in, so I'm going to be a little really kind of tight on it. Kevin and then Ron Ratto. Kevin Hewer, Second Harvest Food Bank, Santa Cruz County, based in California's beautiful Pajaro Valley. My message is about SNAP. When SNAP is strong, my food bank is strong and my community is strong. When SNAP is weakened, my food bank is weakened, my community is weakened. Our food bank runs, runs a pretty lean operation. For every single dollar that we receive, we can turn that into four healthy meals. That's a good thing because I have to feed about one in five local residents in our service area. Some of your colleagues have proposed a 25% cut to SNAP. So I just want to give you a little perspective of what that looks like from, from my seat. As we heard, you know, for every single bag of groceries that a food bank can distribute, SNAP does 19. So what that means is when, I'm at, when I make my delivery to the senior center, for every one bag that I can hand out, that means there's five seniors that may have to choose between looking at their prescription refill and their food budget. When I go out to the Head Start Center and distribute bags of food to the parents, it means five kids might have to wonder, why isn't mom sitting down at the dinner table anymore? When I go and deliver out to the VFW, it means five veterans might have to think about getting that PG&E shutoff notice. So that's what cuts to SNAP look like in my neck of the woods. And this is in one of the most bountiful ag producing regions in the richest state and the greatest country in the world. SNAP is highly effective, it's highly cost effective at reducing hunger and hardship, boosting nutrition, and supporting a healthy economy, especially with our ag partners. 
want to say thank you to Chairman Conway for standing up to those who would like to take a slash and burn approach to SNAP. Your level-headed approach to look at policy analysis and to really listen to the needs and the stories of the community is much appreciated. Lastly, I just want to say that without SNAP as a strong first line of defense, I cannot make up the difference. The food is not there and the dollars are not there. So it only means more hunger, more hardship, and more lost opportunities for vulnerable people and communities struggling to get on more stable footing. Simply put, SNAP works. We'll have to end it there, Kevin, sorry. All right. and I'm gonna get just uh, out of respect for those that are still here. So uh, Ron, Rado, and then Ellie Zegas. Good morning, Chairman Conway and Congressman. Thank you for coming to Modesto along with your staff. Rado Brothers is a 100-year-old uh, grower of uh, fresh market vegetables. We're harvesting vegetables every day to present in the produce markets and, and retail grocery stores uh, in California and elsewhere. Our biggest problem at the farm at this time is labor. Uh, we've tried to recruit labor at local grocery stores, at uh, uh, going to flea markets, visiting early morning bakeries, every which way we can think of. And although I realize it's not in the purview of your committee, it's the, the predominant problem that we have in our farm operation at this time. Uh, another, com another problem that uh, we're experiencing in agriculture in California is nitrates in groundwater. It it's an issue that af affects communities up and down California, both at the farm level, but also in small towns. As, as the committee considers uh, what, what, to, uh, what to do in the farm bill, if there's a way that the committee consider, can consider the issue of nitrates in groundwater and how it might assist communities that need to provide safe drinking water for its uh, citizens, uh, I urge you to do so. Uh, other, other possibilities in the Farm Bill would be, what would be the possibilities for research? Uh, if you can consider research possibilities in automa automation and mechanization that would save labor. Another area of research would be into food safety. Uh, a third area of research would be into pest and disease issues and biologic controls of pests. Uh, last of all, uh, as you reconsider how to, to uh, uh, renew the SNAP program, uh, please continue to include fresh vegetables and produce as, as a main feature of that, that program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Ellie, Zegas, and then Mark McKean. Thank you. Good morning, representatives. My name is Eli Zegas. I'm the Food and Agriculture Policy Director at a nonprofit organization, SPUR, based in the Bay Area with offices in San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. I'm here today with two main asks for you. The first is to continue and expand healthy food incentive programs. Lupe talked about the Double Up Food Bucks program that we are working with her on uh, in San Jose and Gilroy, and you've also heard about it from Alan Moy and Belden Feldman as, as well as others. This is a program that works. It works in two ways. It, it makes healthy food more affordable for SNAP recipients, and it does that by providing matching dollars. In the last Farm Bill, the Congress provided $100 million for pilot programs, and we are a beneficiary of that uh, as one of the grant recipients, as are many, many people across the country. Um, this program works by making the healthy choice an easier choice to do as a supplement to SNAP. And we know that has public health impacts, and you've heard from many others how SNAP and more money for SNAP can help kids in school and adults be better workers. It's just good across the board. We also know it works, and this is what Lupe touched on, is that healthy food incentives support produce growers here in California and, and nationally in other places. Our program matches California-grown produce uh, and gives SNAP recipients a coupon that they can then spend on any produce in the store. There are similar models I think you've heard about in other parts of the country, and having additional funding in this farm bill to continue these pilots and see how we can make this program permanent would be the right way to grow, right way to go, rather. Um, the last thing I'd, I'd like to say, as many others have said, Healthy food incentives only work as a supplement to SNAP, and so we should be looking to keep the current levels of SNAP, not turn it into uh, a block grant program, keep it as an entitlement program. We need to be expanding it, not cutting it, especially in high-cost areas of living like California. Thank you for your work, and I hope you'll take the, both of those into consideration. Thank you, Eli. Mark McKean and then Linda Crow. Good morning. I am Mark McKean, a third-generation grower of row crops and permanent crops. My hometown is Riverdale, a small community in western Fresno Pull County. Closer, Mark. And recently, the fourth generation uh, joined the back on our farm. While cotton prices have improved slightly this year relative to prices of other commodities, cotton is still without an effective and equitable safety net. 
As you may or may not be aware, Pima is the cotton of choice for many growers in California. There are important policy considerations for extra long staple or Pima cotton, which is predominantly grown here in California. Overall, the ELS Cotton Competitiveness Program, the ELS Loan Program, and the Pima Trust Fund should be maintained with some slight improvements in the next Farm Bill. The industry is evaluating the potential for an increase in the loan rate of the ELS Loan Program in order to better reflect the relative market value of Pima cotton. Since this is a non-recourse loan without marketing loan provisions, there should be little, if any, additional government cost or exposure. Also, the ELS com Cotton Competitiveness Program is not currently functioning as intended given the recent shift in the countries that are major producers, importers, and exporters of ELS cotton. For the intended objectives of this program to be met, USDA needs to take steps to update the key price data being used. If, you, if, you, if USDA does not take these steps, then direction from Congress may be needed. I also want to add and, and stress the importance of EQIP dollars. Um, California is a highly regulated place. These EQIP dollars have been extremely important for us to try to implement some of those practices that are necessary to, to come in compliance. So I thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, Mark. Linda Crow and then Kelly Covalo. Hi, thank you so much for coming. It's a delight to be here. My name is Linda Crow, and I'm a second grade teacher here in Modesto, California. I'm also on the board of directors for the National Education Association. And I'd like to talk, give you the message from them. We'll be meeting you again in a few months. To protect and strengthen SNAP, we'd like no block grants, no structural changes, and no cuts. And basically what this means to me as a school teacher, since I look at the little faces in my classroom every morning on whether they're hungry or not. So 25 years ago, I actually saw students climbing trees to eat bird's eggs. Within the past 20 years, I've seen students going through garbage cans to take home food. Under SNAP, and through the assistance of everybody in our community, we have been able to provide free or reduced breakfast, free or reduced lunch, and a snack in the afternoon for after school program. We provide student education on nutrition and through the Stanislaus Department of Agriculture here, we've been able to give them food samples. Try this since they have little corner markets in the area where I live and work. The other thing is to provide a second cup of coffee program where we provide parent education on nutrition. And the, third, the fourth thing that we also provide at our school under SNAP is through United Way, the chef program, every two weeks they have a take home bag featuring the items that they have been educated about, both their parents and the students in class, for them to try. All of these things would be severely harmed if SNAP is reduced. So I've been teaching for a long time, <laughs> and I really don't want to see my students climbing trees going after bird's eggs again. I really don't want to see them going through trash cans. And I really thank all of you for coming and listening to me. But as a school teacher, I cannot provide for the future of our country through education unless they're fed and ready to learn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Kelly and then Rachel Tucker. My name is Kelly Cavello. I am president of the Almond Alliance of California. The Farm Bill is important to the California almond industry with respect to trade, conservation, bioenergy, technical assistance, research, and block grants. <coughs> with respect to conservation, the almond industry has used EQIP funds to upgrade ag motors to help the San Joaquin Valley meet federal air quality standards. EQIP is historically underfunded and always oversubscribed. Additional funding for EQIP will help the California ag industry meet increasingly strict air quality regulations. With respect to trade, the Market Access Program, Foreign Market Development Program, and the Technical Assistance Program for Specialty Crops are very important to the almond industry as we export 70% of our crop. Additionally, we are looking at uh, options to export our byproducts overseas. Despite the importance and success of these programs, MAP funding has not increased since 2006, and FMD funding has not increased since 2002. We urge you to increase funding in these programs, and we would ideally like to see MAP increase from $200 million to $400 million, and FMD funding to increase from $34.5 million to $69 million. Additionally, we fully support the Farm Bill's rural business development programs, but there is a need to expand job training programs. In the next five years, the agricultural job landscape of California will change. 
with the adoption of a new minimum wage and new agricultural overtime laws coupled with rapid changes in science, technology, and mechanization, the ag jobs of today will not be the ag jobs of the future. Lastly, with respect to energy, we have a biomass crisis in California. Open burning is not allowed in the San Joaquin Valley, generally speaking. Cogeneration and biomass plants um, are closing and are becoming less available to our industry. Woody biomass uh, produced in orchards and orchard removals can be used as feedstock for biofuels or bioenergy. However, USDA bioenergy programs have traditionally focused on row crop crops and ethanol production and do not take into consideration biomass uh, from specialty crops. It's imperative that the biomass produced in fruit and nut orchards be eligible for USDA's bioenergy programs. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, Rachel Tucker, and then Pete Garbani. Hello, Chairman Conaway, uh, members of the House Agriculture Committee. My name is Rachel Tucker, and I'm here today on behalf of the California Association of Food Banks. We are a membership organization representing over 40 food banks across the state of California, including 6,000 local agencies that work, uh, work in line with us to address and end hunger here in California. We operate the nation's largest food recovery program known as Farm to Family. Uh, Farm to Family distributes surplus healthy produce and fresh protein to our network of food banks. Farm to Family is a national program model connecting growers, packers, and shippers to food banks, setting a record 200 million in donated pounds in 2016 alone. In addition to the relationships that we've cultivated with our farmers and agricultural partners, Farm to Family um, also works very closely with our grocers and retail partners who provide fundamental sources of expensive but vital uh, protein sources, things like meat and dairy that our food banks highly prize and certainly benefits the health and well-being of the clients and communities that we serve. And as proud as we are of the work that we do to address hunger here in the state of California, we know that we cannot reach everyone in our communities without the support of SNAP. SNAP is the nation's most important anti-hunger program. It serves over 4 million food insecure Californians, including 2 million children. And for this reason, we're deeply fearful of the impact of the House budget proposal and the impact that that would have on our food banks. The current House budget would increase hunger and harm throughout the state of California, and our network of food banks would not be able to absorb the increased need and impact if those cuts are enacted, which is why we believe that SNAP must be maintained in its current program structure. SNAP also boasts significant economic benefit to the state of California. The program drives over $7 billion in local economic activity, particularly in our rural communities, and it's one of the most effective economic, economic stimulus programs throughout the federal government, uh, generating roughly $1.70 um, in local economic activity for every dollar that is spent in SNAP. We thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment and speak to the importance of the program. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Rachel. I'll do Pete and then Cindy Lashbrook. Good morning. My name is Pete Garbani, and I work for Lana Lakes, a national cooperative representing over 2,000 dairy farmers across the U.S. In fact, we have some dairy farmers in the Pennsylvania area, so glad to see you here, Congressman Evans. What I'd like to first say is that Lana Lakes supports federal policy through the Farm Bill that promotes an economically healthy and competitive U.S. ag sector. American farmers, ranchers, and the co-ops they own must have the certainty of a comprehensive five-year farm bill past 2018. We urge Congress to support a responsive safety net together with adequate funding that incorporates improved comprehensive risk management tools, including Title I and crop insurance for producers and their cooperatives. On the lines of dairy, we urge Congress to improve the margin protection program for dairy producers and to support the development of an insurance program for milk through USDA's Risk Management Agency. We support efforts led by National Milk Producers Federation that will improve margin calculations, adjust premium rates and triggers, provide more flexibility in signing up for coverage, and develop other tools, including those outside of Title I, for producers to manage risk. On the lines of conservation, Land Lakes wants conservation solutions to be in the best interest of farmer and supports voluntary incentive-based conservation solutions. We want farmer cooperatives to work alongside USDA to help farmers with the know-how and the tools to make the best decisions for their individualized situation. Lana Lakes offers to help USDA incorporate new technologies into conservation solutions as soon as they emerge. On the lines of international development, we support maintaining existing international food security and development programs, including Food for Progress, Food for Peace, and Farmer to Farmer in order to build stability for a growing world economy. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Pete. 
Cindy Lashbrook, and then we'll do uh, Catherine Smith. Okay, I'm Cindy Lashbrook, I'm a co-owner of a farm on the Merced River about 30 miles south of here. Um, we're certified organic for a couple reasons. One is that we have all this water edge, a lot of habitat, um, a lot of animals, and we live in the middle of our farm. Um, and so, and I've been certified organic since 1991. Um, I've also been on the board of CCOF and on the board of Community Alliance with Family Farmers. So, so organic agriculture and family scale farming are super important to me and what we do. And I'm also a Merced College trustee, so having you use these venues has been great for me. I know the one in Salinas is, I think, at Hartnell. Okay, and basically the National Organic Program, you know, when, when it was developed, it was actually because organic farmers were saying there's too many people out there saying they're organic and they're not, so we asked it to happen. Um, but we need it funded to a level that, that grows with, you know, with, with organic farming as it's growing, plus to really be able to make sure that people can count on organic food being organic. So those of us that care and believe in organic, we want, we want it to be well regulated and well looked after. So please keep that funding, and I think, I think there's some proposals for upping the funding over, over the years. The specialty crop block grants, and I really want to thank your former colleague, I know some of you weren't there yet, but Dennis Cardoza really fought to bring California agriculture into the, into, into the whole farm bill. It wasn't much thought of before. So these block grants, we've seen a lot of local businesses, local agencies, local educational institutions, um, really benefit from, from those, and we're able to customize that for our area. And so we're hoping those stay and, um, and do just as well. I think I'm, oh, I'm almost there. Conservation programs really have to stay because farmers do a lot of environmental services and they don't normally make us money. So the EQIP grants, I'm hoping they stay and that organic programs get funded to the same level as, as, um, as, as the- Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. We're going to go with Catherine Smith and then <coughs> Anya Rodebaugh. Hello, my name is Catherine Smith, and I'm a student of John H. Pittman High School in Turlock. I've just finished a Girl Scout Journey uh, project dealing with nutrition. This project um, helped me learn about local foods and how they uh, have a smaller carbon footprint and less loss of nutrition due to aging and transport. The Turlock farm, Farmer's Market at the fairgrounds is located in the heart of one of the poorer neighborhoods in Turlock. It makes healthy food easier, easily accessible for the people who live there. They accept SNAP payment, payments at, the farmer, at, the, at that farmer's market. Uh, this also helps benefit the local farmers who are selling their products there by increasing sales. Uh, it is important to our community to protect the SNAP program and not separate the bill from the farm bill. Thank you. Uh, Anya? You got to be up here. I'm going to do Abigail Hart next, and then you got to be up here at the speaker because we, we're really, really close and we're really tight on time. There comes Anya. Abigail Hart after that. Yep. Go. Good morning. My name is Anya Radaba. I'm the CEO of Western United Dairymen. I will keep it brief because I understand you guys have been here for a while. It's hot. Uh, we need some different calculations associated with feed adjusters on the MPP program. So we can go ahead and submit our comments in the long, lengthy fashion. But uh, again, I appreciate your time today and thank you for coming to California. Thank you, Anya. Abigail Hart, and then we're gonna have, uh, I think it's Bernadette or Burnett Marsh. Hi, good morning. My name is Abby Hart. I'm originally from a farming family in Ohio and transplanted to California. I'm the agriculture director for the Nature Conservancy. And I'm also a member of the California Roundtable on Agriculture and the Environment. I'm here to speak with you today particularly about maintaining funding for the conservation title, in particular the Regional Conservation Partnerships Program. As you know, we're coming out of a historic drought in California, and we also ha recently have groundwater legislation that was passed that is going to cause dramatic changes to agriculture in our state. We see the Farm Bill as creating lots of opportunities for farmers to partner with people in the conservation sector on um, developing programs, innovative programs to achieve groundwater sustainability. Um, the Regional Conservation Partnerships Program supports collaboration among producers, land and water managers, and conservation partners 
but we want to see two things. In particular, more funding directed to the Re Regional Conservation Partnerships Program and that it has flexibility. For instance, that NRCS could use an umbrella organization like an RCD or a water district to distribute the funding. Um, we've supplied written comments, so I'll leave it at that, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Abigail. Burnett? Yes, uh, I'm Burnett Marsh. I'm from Calusa County, and I'm glad to see my mom here. Uh, our family's a seventh generation farmer, but I'm also a public health nurse for many, many, many years. I support the ongoing food programs, the SNAP programs. I would like to see someone take a look at the internal operation of food stamps, SNAP, and all of them for their nutritional content. The, f the distribution has been to allow the families to make their own choices. I think education within it is good, but there's too much junk food being allowed to be purchased with using the uh, nutrition programs. And I would like to see the junk food portion of it. I've been told the cereal people will be angry, but sorry, sugar cereal, candy, cookies, those foods are not nutritious foods, and I would like to see some way them being taken out. And I think SNAP does a good job, WIC does a good job, but there's the other segment that needs to be looked at. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Burnett. We're really close. We're at 11.55. We have two more, Mr. Chairman. I'll give them a minute each, if that's okay with you, so that that way we cover them all. I know some of these have already been covered, but Janet McCarthy uh, and Chris Wynn, if you'll come up. and uh, but. Uh, we do want to stay on time, but I'm going to ask you to just be brief, but you've been waiting. so. Good morning. Yeah. Um, my name is Janet McCarthy. I'm from Folsom, California. I'm a Humane Society of the United States District 7 leader volunteer. Animals are at the center of so many agricultural operations, and we should not forget about them as the farm d bill is developed. I ask that you please consider the Opportunities for Fairness in Farming Act, or H.R. 1753, which has been referred to the House Agricultural Committee. Farmers don't want to pay into checkoff programs that work against their interests. The OFF Act encourages market fairness, prohibits disparaging or deceptive statements, and promotes transparency. Checkoff programs have repeatedly acted beyond their statutory mandate. They create anti-competitive marketplace practices and engage in collusive and illegal relationships that entail the use of checkoff funds to influence legislative and executive action against family farmers who value traditional husbandry practices. Not only that, but these programs advocate against adv advancing animal welfare initiatives. I thank you for your consideration to support measures like H.R. 1753 when putting together the Farm Bill, which will help to level the playing field for small family farmers. Thank you. Chris? Chris Wynn, volunteer with the U.S. Humane Society. I hope you will consider serious-minded animal welfare policies and include them in the Farm Bill. Since the USDA is responsible for implementing and enforcing major animal welfare laws, I ask you to oppose H.R. 2887, the State's Rights Elimination Act. This measure is an even broader and more dangerous version of Representative Steve King's failed farm provision bill of four, uh, provision four years ago. It is an attack on California agriculture and on animal welfare. More than that, it would nullify hundreds and perhaps even thousands of state laws, rendering states helpless to enforce their own rules on topics ranging from agriculture and food safety to animal fighting. Examples of state laws that it could affect include governing water rights, disease livestock, dangerous pesticides, labeling uh, of farm-raised catfish and salmon, puppy mills, horse slaughter, dog meat, the list goes on and on. The National Conference of State Legislatures, which represents all state lawmakers from both parties, calls H.R. 2887 one of the most coercive, intrusive, and preemptive legislative measures ever introduced in Congress. The National Governors Association We're also have opposes. To wrap it there. Thank, thank you. you. Yep, we got it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're three minutes over your allotted time. We thank you for coming to Modesto for this important dialogue and bringing your committee members here, and uh, really appreciate being a part of this. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate uh, your work this morning. Thank each of you for coming and visiting with us this morning, particularly those of you that shared your personal stories on SNAP. That's uh, really helpful to get that into the record. We appreciate that. Uh, you've just witnessed something that not people ever get to see, and that's five members of Congress being relatively silent for two and a half hours. Uh, I appreciate my colleagues coming this morning to be a part of this uh, exercise in, uh, in, in, uh, in democracy and exercise and getting it right. 
the, uh, I want to thank the Modesto Police Department and the uh, local uh, campus police as well for their security arrangements this morning, top notch. Appreciate the school, Dr. Borges, or Dean Borges, for your, uh, all of your help in making this happen. Uh, I want to thank my staff and all the other staffs who, were pro who participated in this, uh, making this happen this morning and making that uh, uh, move forward. We have challenges on the Farm Bill. Not many of the presenters this morning asked for less money. I don't remember hearing one ask for less money. And so as the five of us and the rest of our colleagues on the committee uh, you know, pray diligently for the wisdom of Solomon as we move forward to try to address all of the issues that you mentioned this morning and how we uh, take scarce resources and apply them to the best of our ability and knowledge for the welfare of the most number of people in this country uh, is, uh, is an important task that uh, we're on the stage of about to embark on that, and we've been on it for, for, for quite some time. When people ask why the Farm Bill, uh, here's a story, um, or not a story, it is a fact. The top 20% of the economic food chain in America, those people in our society who make the most money, spend more on food than the bottom 20% of the economic food chain make in disposable income. Think about that. And so as my colleagues and I examine changes to the Farm Bill, the current Farm Bill, you can hate it or you can love it, but it delivers the most abundant and safest and affordable food and fiber supply of any developed country in the world. You and I as consumers get a deal every time we eat, every time we go to the grocery store, every time we go to a restaurant, we spend less on food than anybody else in the world. Now, we all love getting a deal, but this instance, we don't know we're getting a deal, and most of us don't know why we're getting that deal. So I'm going to deputize every one of you in here to begin to tell that story, because in addition to the farmers and ranchers in, in, to benefit from the, from the farm bill and the SNAP beneficiaries who benefit, Anybody who eats in this country benefits from this farm bill. We need them telling their members of Congress, support the work that gets done as a part of this farm bill process. Uh, and, and I'm going to need your help to, uh, to make that happen and, and get that there. Um, the, uh, the work will get going. We're going to be uh, having one more listening session at least in uh, Illinois. Uh, appreciate again everybody uh, sharing with your heart this morning, those of you that, uh, that were able to testify. And this was the only meeting so far where everybody got to say at least something. And again, I appreciate that. Let me quickly take my member of Congress hat off and just talk to you about something that I think is also of importance that, uh, that face our nation. September will celebrate the 230th anniversary of our Constitution. 230 years of living in this republic, living in this free society, living in a self-governing society that uh, has developed all the opportunities and all the challenges and struggles, but no, but more so opportunities than, uh, than any other nation ever. John Adams wrote that only a moral and religious people can self-govern, that amoral and immoral people have to have a different scheme altogether because they will not voluntarily comply with the laws and, and rules that, that have confront them, even the ones they don't like. And so as we look at that, uh, we need a, we, we've got a struggle. When Benjamin Franklin, who was the oldest fa uh, framer of the Constitution, came out of the experiment, experience, he was asked by a woman, what have you given us, a good doctor, a monarchy or a republic? And he looked at her and said, Madam, a republic if you can keep it. Think about that phrase, if you can keep it. For 230 years, good Americans have kept this republic strong and has provided you and I with the opportunities we've had. Uh, I'm generally concerned that because only a moral and religious people can self-govern, that we're losing the ability to self-govern, and by extension, we will lose this republic if we don't turn this nation's heart around. All of us see things going on in this country every day that God cannot and will not bless, and the list is almost endless. Well, what do we do about that? How do we address that? It is not a legislative fix. Uh, we can't fix it in Congress or the State House or the local uh, county commissioners' courts or city councils. This is something I have to fix and you have to fix. Well, you fix it by living a code. I live the Judeo-Christian model. Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, and I try to live his tenets every single day, and some days I'm better at it than others. But you have to lead a, live a code as well. You and your family, your neighborhood, community, city, all of us have those concentric rings of influence where every day we have to stand up for the truths and the values that have supported and sustained this republic for some 230 years. We've got good men and women in uniform who stand in the breach every day around this world to protect us from bad guys. They put their lives on the line to make that happen. I'm asking you to put something on the line as well. Be a part of that group that's going to reclaim that moral high ground, that's going to claw back the moral authority to continue to self-govern. Because if we don't do that, then at some point, the history of this nation will be written that says that long, slow, miserable decline in oblivion that was the grand experiment in self-governance began in the second decade of the 21st century. You and I do not, I believe, want to be a part of that exercise. 
So think about from time to time what we ask God to bless. And then today, think about what you'll do from this point forward to reclaim that moral high ground that will allow us to extend this self-governance scheme and also protect the republic. As Benjamin Franklin asked, it's a republic, madam, or stated, it's a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Again, thanks for each one of you for being here. Be that keeper of the republic that each of us has to be. God bless each one of you. God bless Texas. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you being here.